and welcome back for another week of Creator Spotlight. I'm very excited that you're all here again. And as uh, a special thank you to everyone who has made Unity so special, this is our Indie Week because Unity loves Indies. Um, so as so for those of you who don't know, this is the first time we're doing an entire summer of streaming just for you, where we invite all of our favorite creators uh, to come on and show us exclusive uh, footage of their games, all the behind the scenes stuff that you guys really want to know how so that you learn how to make your great game and uh, every week we have a different theme and different publishers that we're introducing so we're very excited and this week is a game that's very special because it's quite unique uh in its approach to game development and so we're very very excited but before we kick that off i'm going to introduce myself i'm carol i'm the program manager here at unity and i'm your twitch host and this is my co-host every time i Go to the wrong Point side. Wrong it's direction. Hassan. <laughs> Hello. I'm Hassan, uh, community manager at Unity and Twitch co-host. So happy to be here. Nice. Thank you. So why don't you tell us before we kick it off, if there's anything special we should know about? Yeah, some of you might be joining us from Twitter, some from Discord, and some from the Asset Store. And if you're not on the Asset Store, currently uh, we have the Smash Hit Summer Sale uh, going on so yeah that this is the sale right here uh, it's uh six weekly themes right now we're on the fourth week which is uh, a theme to help you build your fantasy game right so all kinds of assets to build up a fantasy game so you've got you know like your fat an asset for your fantasy ocean or uh your fantasy meadows or gaia pro a great uh, terrain uh tool for building you know your open world environment uh, one of my personal favorites, which I'm going to highlight, is uh, Feel. Uh, this, this really can be used for a fantasy game, or it can be used for any game you're making. Um, and it's got a, it's a tool that allows you to add like juice to your game, to really add impact to everything in your game. So I'm just going to play this trailer for a bit and show this off. I really like this asset. <laughs> it's a really easy to use does not require a lot of coding at all. You can just, you know, add oomph to your game. Yeah. As you, for those who follow our Let's Play uh, streams, as you know, we're always talking about how you can add some added polish to your games, and especially when you're first starting, this is a nice way to get that kick started. Yeah. It makes all the difference. Yeah. This guy did a really good job with the trailer. Yeah. <laughs> They know what they're doing. So this is a big asset store publisher. So if you've ever used the top down engine or the Corgi engine, it's the same publisher. So, you know, trusted publisher makes high quality assets. Definitely worth taking a look at. Stupid question. Is the Corgi engine one where you're just adding Corgis to your game? Uh, absolutely, Carol. Okay, that's what that's I thought. Yeah, exactly what it is. Absolutely. And it's one of the most popular assets on the asset store, obviously. <laughs> 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 if you want to know what the Corgi engine really is, go check it out on the Asset Store. Yeah, please don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> don't ever listen to anything Carol says, no. <laughs> this Just is kidding. why Hassan is the <laughs> community manager for the Asset Store, and I'm not. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, ch check out the sale. Next week, uh, we have the uh, sci-fi uh, theme, and then the week after is the last chance where all the top assets from previous uh, weeks will be on sale at the same time so uh, look forward to that yeah. uh and okay so for today's show we have an incredible game named uh, uh harold halibut which is a handmade narrative game the way they describe it is it's a narrative game about friendship and life on a city-sized spaceship submerged mm. in an alien ocean Games about friendship, my favorite kinds of game. Uh, I personally, I, I've been really looking forward to this game for about like six years now. I was there when the first Kickstarter trailer came mm -hmm. out. Uh, before I was even in the games industry, I've been dying to to, to like play this game. It was one of the games that inspired me to actually come to jump into the industry. I don't think they know that, uh, but now they do. <laughs> uh, so it's really an honor for me to be uh, to bring them onto the stream, to interview them, to and to showcase their game. Um, today we'll be talking to Onat and Ola from the team. Uh, so let's look at a before bringing them up. Let's look at a trailer for the game. Yes. I know who you are. We're the same, you and I. We are? Yes. Drawn to the dark. The damp. 
where the outside world can leak into this place we call home. It may have started with one man, but it took the hearts and minds of many more to make the dream a reality. That dream began at the height of the Cold War, when the world was on the very brink of annihilation. He conceived of an arc-like spacefaring ship. After 200 years, we finally arrived at our destination, only to find that the promising, watery planet contained no habitable landmass and dense, toxic gases in the atmosphere. You know what they say about a captain going down with his ship? That sounds like a sad story. Yeah, but mine is sadder. I was born destined to be a captain of a ship that was already down. Didn't you live through the crash too? Sure did, bucko. Hell of a thing. Everyone certainly had to readjust. Welcome to the Agora Arcades. A new boy, Zim. What's it gonna pick up anyway? Alien radio drama? Professor, would you like to sit? No, thank you. I prefer to stand. A woman of action, I love that. What do you think is gonna happen now that Earth is okay? Everyone wants to go back, but... Yeah, it'll take a while, right? Too long. Haven't you been craving some adventure? Oh, sure, but what if I get the adventure wrong? A meteoroid? Underwater? We're all gonna die! I don't make the rules, Harold, but the rules make me. It looks like our catalytic bacteria is starting to have diminishing returns on the energy output. This sample has definitely been taken from something odd, cool, or on a very radical cocktail of drugs. It's all connected. In this very specific sound pattern, in this melody, music is math, math is nature. It's a countdown. Great. For what? A relaunch window. And if we miss it? We wait for 80 years. Just think what wonders await us down there. Awesome. Thank you. So thank you for joining us, Soul Bros team. Why don't you just introduce yourself first? Hi, thanks, Carol. Hi, I'm Onat, the um, game designer, director, and composer of Harold Halibut. Uh, hi, uh, and thank you as well. I'm Ole, the game's art director. And our names are switched around. Yes. <laughs> <It's>, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we've had such a pleasure, like Hassan and I have had such a pleasure um, playing through the demo, being very excited for this game. I know for, I think the both of us, Hassan and I, like we grew up in an era where stop motion animation was like really, really popular. It probably defined us as teenagers and our creative outputs and things like that. So um, this game has all the nostalgic vibes. I think chat already like got it that the animation, the fact that stop motion, the fact that it makes you think of like <laughs> Wes Anderson, you know, and that whole uh, vibe of like beautiful, hauntingly beautiful games is um, really like, I'm really happy to have you here because I can't wait for you to talk about thank how you. you've created all of this. Yes, thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah, so tell us how the team got together. Tell us about Slow Bros and uh, how big the team is, actually. Well, uh, it, it's been a while since we started, actually. It was almost 10 years ago now, and uh, it just started with one of those random ideas. Like, we are... We want to tell a story and, uh, you know, we, we had various backgrounds back then and uh, we just thought, why, why don't we come together and create a game together um, with the only problem being that we had no idea about how to make games. Um, yeah, but that's, that's basically how it started with uh, Ole. Well, Ole technically joined like a month after we started or so, but then Fabi, uh, uh, still working here, by the way. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, Daniel, who is gone already. <laughs> um, so it, it was the four of us who started um, with that idea. And at that time, it was a lot of uh, yeah, 
one of the reasons why we started building sets and making puppets was actually our inability to do 3D stuff and so on, or classical, mm -hmm. you know, game asset stuff. But of course, also our fascination for stop motion in general. So, um, and, and we actually started building stuff way before we had something playable of the game. Um, so it was, uh, for, for a while, it was just this concept of a handmade game and um, yeah, we built sets and did photos. We experimented a lot for the like first three years or so. It was mostly experimenting with, you know, it started as a, a sto had act actual stop motion 2D point and click adventure. So we were um, actually animating the puppets, um, doing photos of them to actually stop motion animate them. And the animation was sprite based and um, meanwhile, I also uh, did my master's in game design, so I got got to learn a lot about actually making games. And um, my, my master's thesis was basically the first prototype, the one I talked before, like a 2D point and click adventure. And we quickly realized that our vision to create something like very cinematic and that, that draws you into this world, um, we couldn't achieve that with you know, slapping 2D sprite animation on 2D backgrounds because mm -hmm. it was missing all the depth you would have in a like a film where you can stage everything and everything belongs together. It looked like the Photoshop collapse and um, we then quickly realized uh, or, or we're looking for ways actually or even even for engines. Uh, we started with, with a, like 2D point click adventure engine and uh, quickly find, found out that Unity was quite flexible. Uh, and easy to use and probably also the only series engine at that time that could be used by anyone. Um, so uh, yeah, and that, that was basically the start of, you know, creating the game in Unity and uh, uh, there was a lot of experimenting involved, um, as I said before. So we moved from doing photos of the 2D animations to 3D scanning all our assets and um, recreating the world in 3D and being able to use digital lighting, cameras and so on to actually achieve our creative vision of, you know, the cinematic feeling narrative game. And uh, also the focus was much more on the story from there on. Um, so slowly we got rid of everything that actually hindered us uh, in, you know, telling the story, which was pretty much all the puzzles. So you don't have any, it's it's not a point click adventure anymore. It's a narrative game. Um, yeah, we'll focus on storytelling. Yeah, I love and that. Then basically, <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, over time, it was like one coincidence after another, you know, I, it, during our studies, we got to know um, other people. The idea, for example, our, we call them 3D mastermind. It's always hard to uh, put, put job, job titles to yeah, for sure. people in a small <laughs> team because they usually do a lot of things as, as we are ourselves also yeah, do many so hands. he's our 3d mastermind he also you know co-created like the, the pipeline with the 3d scanning and so on but also does like a lot of uh, 3d work but also animation work um yeah and and kind of like that so it kind of organically grew um uh, the daughter of a friend of my mother was looking for an internship and she's like our main character artist now and it was oh. such, so many lucky coincidences actually yeah um that that led us to this we never actively looked for people but they kind of appeared <laughs> yeah, yeah. For maybe the original question uh, for the team members i think that the technology made for an opening to like invite people from outside of uh, game design to mm -hmm. the process as well which is really nice. Uh, so we have people that, yeah, don't have any previous game making and uh, background at all and come from, um, yeah, like craft, craft backgrounds, I guess, <laughs> or uh, woodworking and costume design and uh, a couple of other sort of uh, kind of random fields for, for this industry. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's why I was so. Yeah, I, I think that's why I was so, I think both of those are so excited because they're, your game really showcases the one, number one question that I get in the Discord or when people come up to us and ask us like, how do I start a game? I don't have any experience in game development. I only know how to draw. And I'm like, there's so many great examples of people who come in and are able to pick up game making uh, and 
but come from an art background. I, so I really love that. And, you know, you mentioned film and your background in multimedia and how you uh, so many, I've seen this huge shift recently in a lot of the studios and uh, indie developers we've talked to, which is the shift in like creating more cinematic experiences, not going with the, I think because you don't come from game development, you don't um, come in with like, this set rigid uh, perception of how you make a game. So you care about those qualities, like does the background and the characters mesh well together? You know, you don't come in with these pre like uh, des like designed rules about that kind of stuff. And it really shows. And, you know, we've been seeing this whole movement of making games into films and it doesn't already work so well. It's actually, I think the opposite. It's like films are becoming games now, right? That's the natural progression of that experience. And this is what Howard, uh, Harold Halibut feels like. Um, to me it's like a film experiment <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah even uh that was actually also one of the um problems at first because or problems and also the uh, I suppose I had a, um, advantages because you know we didn't have this view of uh on it like okay this is a background object seen from uh, you know 50 meters away so it doesn't need as many details like that other object that you look closely at or uh, you know, with, with a lot of things, you know, because usually you plan a game in a way that that's something we realize much later, by the way, you plan a game in a way that you don't do unnecessary work. Uh, even you don't often even have backsides of objects or so, so if they are just standing in a in a cupboard, but um, we didn't care for these things at all. So all our objects are three dimensional. They have front and a back, even if you don't see them in the game. And um, but that also led to that, you know, overall quality that um, we now uh, admire ourselves too. That um, you can find so notice so many details, even if things are not necessary um, to be that detailed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah and this, yes. this was kind of organically due to the nature of of the creation process of mm. building these things and yeah yeah can you talk more about that actually so i mean i think it's really obvious to our audience but there's a very unique handmade nature to the game there's your process is very unique as well so can you talk about you know the difference between working in unity and outside of unity yeah maybe we start with the outside world ola is the expert for that <laughs> uh, yeah, although I guess a lot of it is about the, the weaving in between the two, because we essentially um, work as one would in like a stop motion um, studio, I guess, where, where, where a lot of the production was like really uh, physically set apart as well. Like we couldn't afford to put uh, like our office and um, workshop space into close to each other. So we're literally apart. Uh, in like a really dirty workshop, like uh, sawing wood pieces in into bits and uh, making the puppets and whatnot, and then doing like regular deliveries uh, back to the like computer studio, basically. Um, but then, yeah, the, as for the, the weaving of the two, I, I think that makes for a lot of like what makes this interesting in the end, as like the coordination between <clears throat> what is scannable of the things that we make um what is actually you know ultimately what can we make interactive and how like one example is the the characters um and making them interactive um one of the very first sort of debates we had in in the amongst the team people was that all the characters would have to be rigid so Harold is actually the only puppet that we have that still has a like a stop motion rig. So that means he's built, uh, he has like wires inside the puppet body. So you can actually move the individual limbs. So you can, uh, you know, take pictures and move the limbs frame by frame to animate it. Um, but then when we switch to the 3D scanning process, um, we actually, to make each character into like stand in a T pose so they could best be scanned kind of but then that made for like a really awkward modeling experience to like bring the character to life in 
in like mold the clay in the tea pose and like <laughs> yeah. give them like a very neutral expression <laughs> so, so they could be rigged and you know like given life afterwards digitally um as well yeah no then it, it kept going into more and more details like we couldn't uh you can't actually 3d scan glass but uh the costume designer like really wanted uh like um, glass beads for oh, one of the characters, like a whole like, necklace of like hundreds of glass beads, <laughs> <laughs> and didn't really discuss this with the scanning uh, <laughs> section of the team oh. previously. Um, and there was just yeah, a lot of these moments that ultimately, you know, like the the, the glass beads moment was kind of uh, like notorious now as the part pinnacle. Of our <laughs> yeah, because our, our poor 3D character artist Kari had to ultimately like model each of those hundreds of beats by, by oh hand. Oh my God. <laughs> by hand. So oh. that wasn't done digitally in the end? To oh. For oh. Oh. <laughs> Appreciate that scene in the game. <laughs> we will really yes. love that character. <laughs> Spend time with yeah. the glass beads. Hi, Cardi, if you're watching this, yes. sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we appreciate your work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, it was also, you know, this... From the moment that where where it was uh, the decision was made that you know it's going to be physically built but then a lot of some a lot of parts are also in you know made in unity like the lighting camera work and even you know the animation is motion captured for example um you know every, every we actually uh, looked into every single one of those processes and it wasn't about like okay we want to have uh, everything as analog as possible, but we were looking at, you know, recreating this feel and combining basically the best of both worlds. We have that um, very organic feeling, tactility um, of the physical models and puppets and so on, that you can see even though the end product basically is, is digitized, you know, and is digital. And uh, on the other hand, we, um you know the lighting is at times you know sometimes it's like very realistic but sometimes it's also hyper realistic because it adds to you know the story that we want to tell um so that, that that was a nice thing that being in that digital world we had the freedom to pretty much do everything but we could also rely on you know the physical accuracies i i, I would say of um unity's lighting system or hdrp's lighting system um so i mean we will talk a little bit about that later uh, so i can explain some more things but it's it's similar to how, how film works because um real film is of course bound to real world rules you know so you have a light that actually cuts the light and it always has this inverse square fall off but then again you know you would have uh for example uh a lamp uh, standing on the table, but you would add to that light artistically by putting another light mm -hmm. out of the picture to actually create your lighting setup. So it wouldn't be the only light casting that, you know, or adding to that to that overall lighting of that scene. And that's the same we pretty much do in Unity. So we, we also have that like physically correct that lighting, but it's even nicer because you know while while you're shooting a film you always have to take care is the lighting fixture uh, can it be seen through the picture can, well, yeah we have to hide it somewhere or so and um the lights themselves are pretty much invisible in yeah. in unity so we only see the effect of the light which gives us a lot of freedom to yeah light our game yeah i really like uh, you mentioned you know uh, you've been working on this game for a really long time and uh, some of the reviews you hear of like games nowadays it's like oh this game already feels like two years old like you see big triple a titles that have that and i think because you totally understand that sometimes you have to pivot and that you know you change with the limitations or the new changes that come you're all you're on the bleeding edge too we can talk later about that of uh, everything yeah. that's being offered with unity but i think that's why it still feels so modern it still feels really relevant, you know, even though it's, you've been working on this for a really long time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, it's, and it's, it's also, also, of course, the, the physical models, because they have this timeless quality in them, yeah. you know. Uh, obviously, there's, it's, again, you know, the, those two things, because on the other hand, we, we are really happy that, you know, 
our engine is updated by you people. And uh, so it gets me. better. What do you uh, mean, you people? Uh, <laughs> and, me, me specifically. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Carl, and, alone in and on the other hand, you know, the source material basically has, uh, you know, we even though we started at a time where, you know, the, the resulting texture resolution, for example, would have been, I mean, we were thinking about bringing this game out on PlayStation 3. So just just so you know the time. That should be sailed. And of course, it's, it's a whole... Yeah, <laughs> actually funny if you look into like some older pictures of you know, screenshots of the game. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really funny. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's again, uh, because we have that basically infinite amount of detail in the real world models and uh, we only scaled down texture, for example, in the engine and we just, you know, when we moved to the next console generation, we could just, you know, uh, set the actual texture texture resolution higher, or now even more with virtual texturing, which we'll also talk briefly about later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you mentioned um, like one of the advantages of taking these physical assets into the digital world when it comes to the set building, which was you know the invisible lights, not having to worry about what's caught on camera and what's not. Uh, so I wonder what your thoughts are, you know, if there are movies right now, like, you know, I Love Dogs or Fantastic Mr. Fox or any of these stop motion films that are, you know, built physically. But do you think that the, in the future that we're more likely to see these films and animations built physically, but then uh, directed digitally? Um it depends. I, I, I don't think that one thing will replace the other, but in mm -hmm. fact, uh, a good friend of ours is actually using the same or our technology now to, he's uh, producing a pilot for a TV series now, okay. uh, which is really interesting. So you can be really excited. I'm also using Unity for that, by the way. Yeah. Um, so uh, he, he just got funding for, to, to, for, for the pilot of this TV series. And, and in the context of a TV series, for example, it totally makes sense because, you know, the building process, for example, of obviously is the same as for a regular stop motion film. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to produce 10 or 20 or maybe even several seasons of something, there is this certain efficiency that you gain by animating everything digitally and also the flexibility. And then, then again, you can use the same assets for a lot of things. Maybe you want to make a game spin-off of the same thing or do some live avatars of the film's characters or series characters in a stream, which is all possible through, you know, the usage of a real-time engine like Unity. Yeah. On, and on the other hand, you can go like full path tracing now and render out like really polished frames um, of, for, the, for the series. So um, there is a lot of benefits of this hybrid approach, but then again, you know, if you the the visually, I guess it you know it's it's again something different. Um, it's it's a hybrid. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't say yeah, it could totally replace the traditional way of animating because it has uh, you know the traditional way of animating still has a different feel to it. For example, for our game, we decided uh, we were even experimenting with recreating that like kind of jittery stop motion look and reducing the frame rate. And we quickly realized it didn't feel nice to play something because it, it, it felt like um, actually a low frame rate game, you know. But then, mm. for example, for the facial animation, we went that way. So again, there is a hyb hybrid approach there. We have, uh, you know, uh, no in-betweens for the facial animations because that looks good, but for the right. gameplay and the characters, we want to have a smooth experience. And um, yeah, so also for, I uh, just saw uh, um, making off of the Dark Crystal series uh, on Netflix. Uh, it's also interesting because they use the hybrid approach as well. They, they actually build all the sets uh, and puppets and you actually have those marionettes um, being there, but to give them a little more expression in the face, they did digital face replacements and animated the mouths or so digitally on top of the actual moving puppets. Right. So um, I can see a lot of, you know, uh, hybrids 
ways of creating there because uh, you know both both things have their benefits yeah. i would say mm. yeah lots of merging there's also as maybe a last thing the um green screens being replaced by like uh led screen situations mm -hmm. and game engines being used to like uh create like actual environments around actors uh, for them to not have to deal with you know like tennis balls on a stick yeah uh, yeah the, so they can the feel creature. like they're there present in the scene right they can actually yeah, and have like display. actual like the the light reflect on them and yeah and there's lots of advantages but uh, just generally i feel like there's there's so many paths crossing from yeah. those worlds it's exciting i think that's a perfect segue to jump into so you know where we're talking about directing these scenes digitally i think it's a perfect segue for you to show us how you actually direct a scene within the game, right? So uh, you're gonna show us maybe a cutscene sure. for the game, and then we're gonna break that down, right? So let's cut to uh, yes, their exactly. Onat screen, then Onat screen share, and we'll take a look at the game in editor. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Can you see my editor already? Yes, we see it. Yeah. Okay, so this is one of the areas of our game, the Agora Arcades, a huge marketplace mm -hmm. with, you know, a bar, a little skiing stuff store. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, whatever it is, is <laughs> a general store and an uh, actual arcade, like a gaming arcade. Right. Um, so, yeah, why don't we jump right in and um, I will. I will walk you to a dialogue scene um, to show you how, how, how that works. Okay. And then what I'm going to do next is basically delete all, all the things we did for that and uh, recreate it and explain a little bit how we approach these things because we have a total of like nine hours of dialogue in the game if you count like all the side stories and background dialogues and so on. And then you can imagine that's that's a lot. So we automated a couple of processes. Actually, it makes me nervous seeing the, cons <laughs> seeing the console doing stuff. So. <laughs> just just <laughs> unity things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm just playing it right now here with my controller. That was, by the way, also an interesting thing. People were talking uh, or asking us when they saw, you know, the first trailers or so of the, the game. Uh, they thought it's you know, kind of going on rails or so because it looks so stop motion animated. But in mm -hmm. fact, you know, I'm, I'm just can walk around as, as I want. And you can see the advantages of it being 3D is that I can actually as even zoom in into stuff. Yeah, I get some characters. This is incredible, yes, by the uh, way. Yeah, because we've seen like I love point and click games, adventure games, but they tend to be very static. Even in the like I've seen some that have ventured to try to create with uh, like stop motion animation. But this is like a whole it just feels completely different. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Also, the scale yeah. of things. I love how yeah. you know, when you, come yeah, into this room, you pull the camera back and you can just see so much. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, that's fine. I, I just wanted to say uh, I'm, I'm really bad at multitasking. So there might be times where I just stand still because I'm listening or talking with you. And no the problem. other times while I'm concentrated <laughs> on doing the stuff in Unity. So <laughs> just, um, yeah. No worries. Oh, by the way, on a side note, I totally forget, forgot <laughs> about this guy. I don't know if you will recognize him. <laughs> Oh, I love oh, how you would do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, is this in the actual game yeah. or is this just for the prototype? Or is this actually, are you actually going to be? No, in no it, it is It is actually in the actual game, but oh, I, I did have no, uh, no, um, what's this? Uh, I couldn't decide what I wear, so they, uh, you know, they gave me this strange yeah. out. It's generally <laughs> the, the team's decision to, to integrate. It was important, yeah. He's the only part of the team. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love there's like yeah. a stand up about it. It's like, what, what should he wear? <laughs> it's like decided. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, while, while we are at it, I could also just quickly enter the general store, um, show you these. That's what I meant. You know, we have like all these assets in mm -hmm. here, all these. Oh, it's still this guy. Um, you know, for example, all these 
individual object that <laughs> all created at one point. And, These are um, all handmade, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I just need the, yeah. the audience to realize some, that some every the... object you're looking at was physically made in real life and scanned into the game. <laughs> yeah. Somebody in and chat is like, I can't easy. figure out how to make stuff fade in and out. I think we'll, we won't go exactly into that. that, but we're going to yeah. look, yeah, there's going to be, it's going to be great because they actually have a really interesting approach to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, oh, I thought the controls don't work anymore. So yeah, but let's go to that. Oh, actually I didn't make a mistake because I actually have to load the scene I want to. This is our little debug menu. So mm -hmm. I will jump to the area of the game where I, I can actually talk to that character because right now I could have walked into there and um, the person I want to talk to, which is Rafi, wouldn't have worked. <laughs> mm. So um, we're going to jump to another scene. minute. Yeah. yeah. Somebody in I chat mean, it's, it's says the same that. Unity scene, but yeah. No, no, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, it's the same Unity scene, but you know, you can already see there are some characters here now and also in the bar. Yeah. So it's just, just a different point in time, basically. Okay. Okay, so I'm walking in here again. Yeah, I love going to the same scene in a game where, but like, you know, having different things happening or it's like a different time, mm -hmm. a different time of yeah. day. Yeah. It was important for us to create this living world where, mm -hmm. where, you know, things change and people do their things and, you know, we have that kind of variation going on. So let's see. I hope you can hear the sound of, uh, of this, actually. No, that's a haircut. Because I don't hear it right now. Oh, there's no audio right now. Okay. You know, what happens here is basically, you know, when we approach that character, a timeline starts playing and mm -hmm. um, through that we control the facial animations and the actual animation and the cameras and all that stuff, basically. Um, and we recorded all the audio files before, obviously, um, and that's the motion capturing based on those um, those dialogues. So what, what we actually do in the real world is, you know, we have we have the dialogue already edited and let it run and act according to what happens in the dialogue. So we have these like very realistic animations uh, for for those scenes. Okay, so let's let's um, get out of this and I will show you how. Yeah, how we so, work on that. So basically, there's like a sort of choreography happening, right? So the characters will speak and then lots of things have to sync up the audio the camera work um exactly and yeah so all that's going to be done um, in the timeline while exactly yes the animations okay so um i'll go in and delete all those things now Remember you telling us before this that you can essentially put a scene together in like 15 minutes. Uh, you, you can slap yeah. all the scene together. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's actually, you know, obviously that's not the average, but, um, yeah. you know, from having basically nothing to having it basically set up, it's only 15 minutes. And then, of course, you know, you spend a lot of time like tweaking the cameras. And of course, yeah doing the lighting for it and so on. But yeah, that's basically it. And with all the tracks that go into a timeline like this, um, you can imagine that wouldn't be possible without some custom tools um, that we built, which are basically, <laughs> 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 which are basically all based on, you know, hide the console, hide the console. There. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So, um, <laughs> I think the console is like taking all, like having a messy room and taking everything, throwing it into the closet and <laughs> shutting it, <laughs> ignoring it. <Yes. laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay, I will delete these two.
someone Hopefully in I don't chat the wrong things someone in chat thinks that um harold has a nice of uh, strut uh full of dad energy <laughs> nice <laughs> <laughs> is harold the dad hmm by the game and find out <laughs> <laughs> By the way, our project is like huge now. So we're like the library is like 120 gigs or so. Mm. So sometimes, sometimes like basic. basic, basic, especially, you know, asset management processes might take a while. Um, delete this timeline too. I'll explain you in a bit why, you know, there is basically three parts going into every one of those timelines. So it's gone now. This is basically what you see here is just the basic hull of uh, that conversation. So it, it's just the logic that plays the timeline. Okay. I'm leaving it there because it's placed exactly in that moment. So I don't have to set that up, um, but there wouldn't be a dialogue now. So um, and now I'll jump to another piece of software that we use, which is amazing, by the way. Um, RTC Draft, which is basically the tool where we built our whole game design document in. Mm -hmm. uh, don't worry, I'm not showing any parts of it where you would be spoiled, because this is like all the beginning of the game. Um, I don't want to, you know, uh, I don't want any spoilers, spoil please. the surprises. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you can imagine it's it's a quite complicated and huge structural monstrosity psychopath table thing. <laughs> that, uh, you know, has like these sub, sub, <laughs> I just wanted to say sub tasks or so, but almost like that, you know, we have like all these little elements and each one of those speech bubbles is basically one of the, our dialogues. Mm. So um, this is the dialogue we saw just before. Um, so this is the first step you can you see design the conversations. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, Danny, our uh, writer, um, always wrote in a separate program because he hated writing in here. But then we, you know, quickly, one, once that was done, also, so we, we created that overall structure and uh, wrote little descriptions and exported all that. So he could write all these little dialogue snippets. Mm -hmm. And then we imported those dialogue snippets back into uh, RTC like this to lay it out. Um, so it's connected to those characters and we see like the dialogue text in here um, and the overall flow. And if we have like branching dialogue, for example, there would also be the branches here. This one is not a branching branching dialogue. Um, and it even, you know, uh, there is even a variable that's being set in the end. We can already put that in. That's the nice thing of this software being specifically made for games because you can also put in like game logic and there is actually an, uh, um, a Unity export, which is what we used. Handy. Uh, what we use. Yeah, it's super handy. And, um, you know, you can pretty much export the whole data set. You could also export all those pictures and stuff like that. You can choose what to export, which we, of course, didn't need those pictures. And we didn't create like too complicated game logic in here besides of like the variables we want to set. So it's all well, well organized. So what we basically do is um, export all those dialogues and all those um, all those variables out of RTC Draft into Unity. And then basically we have this huge data set where we can search for these things. Um, and now, let's see. So um, Gab, uh, one of our programmers, built this tool, which is the Dialogue Action List Generator. Um, this basically picks up that that exported file from from rtc draft and um we can use this handy search box to um search for that dialogue name this is an editor only tool by the way so uh yeah and it already showed it and just so you see there is like a bunch of yeah i'll just quickly show it maybe there are some spoilers in there <laughs> <laughs> but you can see there is a huge list of dialogues i think it's uh 700 i'm not sure anymore <laughs> a couple hundred of dialogues actually that we have um and so yeah this is the dialogue and then um i can import this as a timeline click an update conversation 
So are these so files now entire is, conversation? Uh, oh. Or is it single dialogue? When you search for this uh, um, first conversation, is it like... It's... Go ahead. This one is basically the whole conversation that contains all those dialogue lines. And as, as it's pretty similar to what it, what is here. So every single bit of it contains, you know, there, there are actually elements for every single dialogue bit. Uh, so every line, basically. And you can also see in, yeah, we have these technical names just to give you a little more insight into the actual background process. Um, every single one of those lines has a, you know, um, technical name. And this is a different one than this one, um, as you can see. So um, based on this technical, our audio files also have this these, the same technical um, names for each line of dialogue. And also our localization tables also have the same uh, technical names and so on. So we can like put everything together. And um, in, in Unity, what happens basically now is that the script goes through, it picks that conversation, goes into it, picks every single line and looks, you know, and copies the text into, okay, it's open here. Mm -hmm. So I can show it to you. So based on the characters that are inside the dialogue, it creates two, you know, track groups for each of our characters. And um, as the underlying system for all that, you know, data that goes into our game, we are using Adventure Creator, which is a really amazing tool from the asset store, by the way. We customize a lot of parts of it, but it really made it easy for us to start at, at a time where we couldn't code at all. And now, you know, that we know more, we replaced some things, but we are still relying on like the, the underlying systems of that, which is like really handy. Um, and one of its features is like the speech track, which, you know, it connects with, with the general dialogue system, basically of Adventure Creator. And what the speech track does is it contains, you know, in, in the actual speech track, you see um, the character that's talking in this case it's the player line which is automatically checked again by our script and here we have you know that's these are have been the work in progress names of those characters but that's basically rafi's track um and then we have like all those individual dialogue lines here again you know you see the technical name here so um that's what i already talked about before um we also have audio clips that um have the exact same names and uh yeah so this tool basically sets up all these little dialogue lines puts them in here and uh, puts the text in there assigns it to the speech manager id and so on um but so what this would would do when i when i would play it now would basically be it would look for the audio file play it back but nothing else. So it's basically just just the bare dialogue. And also, if you noticed it already, all those little bits have fixed lengths lengths right now. So um, it doesn't know about the length of the audio files yet. But since again, you know, everything has the same number, we can um, just go onto the timeline again. A little tool we built. Right click on it and say update duration and move. And what this, this does is actually pick up the right audio sort uh, the audio clip, look at the length of it, and then arrange all the, or adjust the length of all those clips. So if you look closely, you know, right now they are all the same, basically. And um, we update the duration, it's quickly scans through them and uh, sets the right length. So um, and this is also what you know displays the subtitles. Were they off before? I, I didn't. Oh, maybe yeah, I should. So. No, yeah, okay. So uh, usually we also have subtitles, uh, also in nine languages, by the way. So this also handles all that localization stuff and so on. So once we have that, because we wanted to have you know a self-contained timeline just for this bit, because this is totally automatically created. So if we do some adjustment and so on, we can just update this without touching like the manual work we did. So uh, that's the reason why this basically is a separate timeline than the actual timeline where we set up the cameras and the, you know, all the other things. So from this point on, um, again, I right click on the same timeline and say, um, set up main timeline. And this basically does two things. It 
creates another timeline which amongst other things uh contains this timeline here and creates a prefab with you know some folders to put stuff into so we have an organized structure with this timeline on a playable directory already mm -hmm. and um let's see so now if we it's again the same name but with timeline okay timeline so yeah it's these two clips basically uh, these two things so we have um the automatically created timeline oh just takes a moment okay i'll just drag it into our scene to show you the contents of what or what happened so we um our tool has created this prefab which um contains the main playable director which yeah. was also just created i will look into that in a closer in a bit um it has also assigned the other timeline we looked into before on a second uh, dialogue playable director here and we have empty folders basically for all the other things we might need um and so this is the main timeline we are looking at these two first tracks are basically for you know we have a video recorder already set up so once we have worked on a timeline we can export it for our uh, so uh, sound designer for example or for internal reference also for versioning so i can just mute it by pressing m the camera recorder uh, also has a similar purpose it's basically um in, in, when we start working on those timelines um usually the animations are already recorded and basically set up but still in a very rough state they are not cleaned up yet um because often it doesn't make sense to perfectly clean the whole animation clip if you know half of the time you don't even see the character so right. we uh you know after we finish the timeline and set up the cameras we export the camera data so our animation people can actually look into uh or see what we see in the game and just clean what's necessary nice. i'll also mute that one because we don't need it right now so um this is basically a control track that um points to that other timeline that we showed before we can even that's a nice thing with the um basically with the uh how do you call it, call it? This, this structure inside of timelines that you can have timelines in timelines in timelines sub timelines section basically so yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 exactly which is really nice because you know you can always look into there and even even the playhead stays at that point so um you can also see if i go in there and this also shows where where basically the overlying uh, track ends so we can quickly see okay it's here so this is the length of our dialogue mm -hmm. what also happens is again you know we have track groups automatically created for us we have a camera strike with three um cinema machine tracks it's not that we always need three but we often need three or more because of organizing and we can delete the ones that we don't need um we have a track group for each of the characters um that um yeah and an audio track that is empty for you know things that we get from our sound designer or so and then this preview audio track which contains the audio of um of the scene it's basically all these little snippets put together because there is not a live preview for these little dialogue things it's basically game code that code that is called once a dialogue line plays so for previewing it in the editor we use um uh, an audio clip of the of that same dialogue right um again you know we have all these previews in a folder in the project as like full clips it's called the same again so it, it's just doing a name search for the preview files uh with the same name and the animation files with the same name you can see like the individual animations here uh which which i had already placed in the folder and some interesting details about how we set them up because we'll actually see that in a bit oh my gosh and we're, we're back, back. <laughs> <laughs> we knew what we were doing the whole time <laughs> Gotta figure it out. Sure. <laughs> we just needed a break all right let's jump, <laughs> let's jump back into editor so what were we saying what were we saying uh just a minute ago 
Okay, yeah. So we have automatically created this um, timeline here that contains another timeline, which contains all the dialogue snippets. And um, these all these individual lines are connected again to a, a little audio clip with that bit of dialogue. And uh, you know, once once this is running in the game, it automatically plays the di dialogue line that belongs to it and also shows the subtitles. But uh, unfortunately, you know, we don't have an, a live preview of that inside the editor. So to be able to work on it without, you know, having to jump into play mode and back and so on, we um, basically created these preview audio tracks. And um, yeah, in this preview audio track, I can actually play it back. This this contains the whole audio of this dialogue scene, basically. So let's just play okay, it. Robbie. Please. Mm, Harold. Is everything okay? The tube route to the school in the social district is out. Okay, I think that should be enough. So nice. Um, now, th this is going to be the base we use or our, our orientation to create like the whole timeline. Um, so, these two animation clips were created by our um, animator. Uh, you know, our 3D mastermind Ilya has created these animation clips, um, and you know he he also has all those scenes in Motion Builder where he cleans up the animation. So he already sets them up in certain spots, and these are basically the Koreans. Oh, before we come to that, I will actually show another little thing. Normally, I would you need to like spawn the characters and insert them here to be able to see the animations on the characters. But uh, we also have a little tool for that, which is the Timeline Auto Assigner. Mm -hmm. I just click on Spawn Missing and it automatically assigns all the stuff and spawns oh, whatever is not inside the scene. So everything is connected there and you can already see both of our characters moving and there. All the arcades. Oh dear. <laughs> Um, obviously, they are at the wrong spot, and also the timing is not right. So for the timing, that's that's the easy one actually, um, because we have we usually have a clip in of 150 frames. So that's something that if it's something else, Ilya will just write that in a text file. Um, oh, that's the wrong one. Um, so I will just set this up quickly. So we are basically in sync with the. Um, with the sound. Social district is out. Oh, right. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah, we will be able to see that clearer once uh, the characters are at the right positions. And now again, like I said, because he has the same set and even the same distance from the, you know, uh, zero transform and so on, he can uh, give me the exact coordinates where the characters have to stand. So I just click on the track headers and can cop copy basically these these values in or write them in. So for Harold, it's in this case 12.12409. And then here we have the 9.015887. And then for Rafi, it's um, 10.98159. Mm -hmm. I love seeing Rafi just fly off screen like that. Yeah. Uh, fun idea. Ilya always gives me uh, these coordinates. So it's basically the folder with the animations that contains these text files. Okay. Um, by the way, the text files themselves have no contents, but we use text files to have, have it readable inside the folder. Uh, so it's actually the naming of the text files shows me the coordinates, so I don't mm. have to open anything else. So yeah, oh. they automatically Smart. flew into the right spot. Yeah, and here they are, um, where they should be. You can already see it kind of looks right. Yeah. Now, if I look, would look at it in the game view, it's obviously we didn't set up any cameras yet, so that doesn't work. But we can already take a look at it here, just for a couple of seconds. Mm, Harold. Is everything okay? The tube route to the school in the social district is out. Oh, right. Makes sense. Annoying. That's not what's annoying. Oh? Kids. Everywhere. <laughs> All the time. Obviously the kids. No school means no peace. There he is. 
Okay. So, um, yeah, that's it. And yeah, it's time basically to set up the cameras. That's a nice thing with, you know, being able to preview it right here, even the, the, though the mouths are not moving right now, because that again is, uh, called through that, that in-game bit through the speech track. It also calls the animation files for the facial animation. But it's uh, good enough to set up the whole animations like this without having to enter play mode. As I said, the project is 120 gigs um, in just the library size. So even though we are using or have, even though we have disabled domain reload, it takes a while to enter and uh, leave play mode, as you have seen before. So the less we have to do that, the better. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's do some camera work. Um, Yeah, at this point, so the further you I get in the game, already... it takes longer and longer to jump into play mode, huh? It's like it's funny because your workflows become faster and yes. faster, but the game gets bigger and bigger, so things kind of even out, right? <laughs> <laughs> Probably <laughs> might be the reason for that. So um, yeah, I have we have created some some camera prefabs. In fact, I've never used the ones I created because I usually adjust them here but i will just drop a camera in cameras here and um so the reason why i have created this camera prefab is basically oops because it, it contains some scripts like the machine setting script that uh, we, we also set up and a volume setting with a depth of field volume so that we have automatic focus tracking so um and, and this is a custom script that we made again where we can just click this checkbox and choose a character the oh, you shouldn't show all the characters <laughs> um but, but basically choose the character and automatically set a look at or follow target um during gameplay so in this case let's say this is going to be we can herald and i usually write the um the focal length of the lens there nice. that i'm planning to use and I just duplicate it and say this is VCAM Rafi, also 50 millimeter. And then usually I would, once once I've basically set them up, I would copy them to do some variation and so on. But let's do some basic stuff as we mm -hmm. don't want to spend hours just on that today. Okay, so for Herald, I'm obviously choosing Herald here in the checklist and say I want to set the look at target. Same for Rafi. It's the um, hacker fire or that look at target. Okay, and um, and I'm also going to. Oh, by the way, I usually lock this so it doesn't go away if I click somewhere else. Now I'll I'll just drop both of those cameras inside my timelines camera tech tracks that I've already set up just somewhere so I have some uh something to preview okay let's look into that that was to be expected because both of those cameras are are at uh you know the zero position zero, now zero, zero, yeah. so um a nice nice handy trick by the way that adam showed me by the way adam michael um uh, is i because i didn't know that before too it's shift control wait I'm constantly switching between Mac and PC, so I'm kind of getting uh, a bit, but I think it's shift control F. Let's see if that works. Yes, it is shift control F. So if you click on any object and then use shift control F, the nice. object you have selected is basically placed wherever you are uh, at in the scene view and also yeah. looking at. So if I, for example, do, do this now Line and then look at it at this, you can already see it. it's that place. So mm -hmm. I use that to quickly, you know, place my cameras around, you know, so it's not exactly, it doesn't have to be exact, you know, just so they are not so far off. So use that, something like this for Harold. And then for Rafi, I would do something like this probably. Okay, and now we can look at it again. So looks perfect. <laughs> Now, um, I have chosen the characters that this camera has uh, should look up, uh, look at with the, the composer. The composer is activated on both of those. Right. But I didn't 
you know, it again, it's something I where I would normally need to put the transform in and in game mode, in play mode, I have a script that does it automatically. Mm -hmm. But for the editor, we have also bound that to a shortcut, which so for everyone uh, watching, this is where right now we're looking at the Cinemachine virtual camera in the inspector. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> wait, let me just okay, check the, the character. maybe it's because changing the might be because of changing of the Unity version that my <laughs> shortcut doesn't work. Well, it does. Oh, it's because <laughs> the, I have the wrong language setting. Okay. Ah, now it works. So I've, I've pressed the shortcut and those cameras automatically look at the characters now. Amazing. I will show you the, um, the guides actually, which should be visible. Strange. Normally you should be able to see the guides here, which kind of don't appear because they are checked. But anyway, right now, um, my camera is automatically targeting Rafi. So if I move it, for example, to the right, you can see it still tracks Rafi. That makes it really easy to set that exact position. But before I do that, I want to adjust the tracking so I can go um, into the aim settings. Oh, now it's it's shot. So that that's basically my kind of preset um tracker already so i will usually i i just do some fine tuning with you know the screen x and the screen y mm -hmm. so something like that it's you know i'm going for a really quick setup for now yeah, yeah we'll bring it a little bit back do you find it you often get okay lost in this view. part like getting uh, like very yes. much perfectionist to get the exact position for every scene exactly but but we have Exactly, totally. But we have noticed that um, it goes back and forth, you know, so you keep on tweaking stuff forever. So what we move to is basically now actually setting up everything relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the, like those standard dialogues like this one, um, not all those dialogues ha have like super complicated camera movements. Sometimes it's just, um, you know, uh, shooting back and forward and some variation to show some other characters or so yeah. um, and some of them are really complicated they might take a day or so but um, we usually do like a quick pass just setting up the basic cameras and then doing the other things and then coming back to it because then you have a like clear and fresh mind to look at right. it and like several iterations which goes for a lot of those um those processes. Oh, by the way, of course, I wrote that I'm using a 50 millimeter lens here, but I didn't choose it. Coincidentally, this is set to 50 millimeters. Oh. Let me show you that. I have created a pack of lenses I frequently use here. Um, honestly, I don't frequently use the 12 millimeter, but it's, it's uh, really nice in some <laughs> occasions. So, um, you know, coming from a film background, it's like really nice to have uh, basically the, the same settings possibilities and i can for anyone who doesn't know that um if you go at the lens settings in the cinemation virtual camera and click on edit presets you can actually create your um presets for all the lenses with um you know the focal length length mm -hmm. but also things like the aperture value that it's set to in the moment you assign that preset so i've set up my lenses here and um, okay, so the only thing I need to do then is basically select the lens I want to use. Um, and yeah, so we have basically set up Rafi. Let's set up Harold. Um, again, just move it a bit like this. It's nice to be able to see a bit of the arcades here actually. Oh, by the way, we stole this picture the from background. the internet. It's a placeholder for an hour for in, in case you, the creator of this picture image here is because watching, watching this. the we stream really right sorry. now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And thank you. It's, it's just a placeholder. <laughs> Don't sue us. <laughs> 
Mm. Um, um, there's a question from chat, um, if you don't mind, because you know you're showing us a lot of yeah, little sure. tools for automation. So Sundaray just asked, do you use uh, Imgui or UI toolkit for the tools you make? Or neither? <laughs> um, yeah, we are using Imgui for that. Uh, for example, for the um, the Cinemachine settings thing here, I used Imgui. And actually, when e UI Toolkit um, came out, I mm -hmm. recreated this in UI Toolkit to see how easy it is to, to create like uh, editor tools for that. Um, but none of the my UI Toolkit tests are being used right now because it, you know I didn't have too much time to look into that yet. But it's it seems like it's a really easy way because it was always a hassle to create nice GUI. And I only did it actually for a couple of tools that I frequently use like this one. I like, you know, that it only shows whatever I need, but it's not so easy to use because you have to define the a lot of things. Um, and yeah, UI toolkit really seems to solve those problems. Mm -hmm. So, you know, since it was released, I didn't do any new tools, but uh, if I should do it, I would definitely use that instead of having the hassle of like, you know, scripting all that. Nice. Um, okay, again, you know, I'm, I, I think that should be fine. Maybe I'll, I will move the camera a bit again, because I'm tracking Harold, it's like really easy to go in. So now, yeah, I can already see this is a very odd shot in the beginning. Maybe I will just duplicate Rafi's camera, drag it in here. Okay, yeah, that looks better already. But um, let's go with something wider. So let a uh, three, five. It's mostly, it's basically like that. I'm duplicating stuff I already have, setting up some new angles um, and maybe bringing it a little bit, bit back. Yeah, we basically reduced it to the part that actually makes fun because, you know, setting up all those tracks is just, uh, you know, tedious work. It's okay if you're only doing one or two timelines, but if you're doing 600 of them, it's it's just lost time, basically. And then that's that's what I quickly realized. I, I haven't been a programmer in the beginning. Um, I started using Unity, but if I, I used it for a long time without writing a single line of code. And... Um, when I realized that I could save so much time by just by just um, doing small little scripts like a character configurator that automatically puts like all the character scripts I need on every single character. If you have something like that, uh, if you have a process that you repeat over several times and maybe even some iterations of it, it totally makes sense to because writing these kinds of scripts is not so hard actually, and that's how I learned programming because I wanted yeah these things to do the work for me instead of me doing all all those chores um yeah it should should be fine for that now exactly yeah 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 um thankfully you can do a lot of things in unity without a sing writing a single line of code and now even more because there's even visual scripting um which I briefly looked into and looks really nice. Um, I knew Bold from a friend who really liked it. Um, for me, it came too late because now I can program, <laughs> but, but uh, it's a really nice start. And also logically, it's the same thing. So I guess, uh, you know, learning with that and then jumping to, um, to, to actual scripting or so is, is a very logical step. Um, back in that time, I've used uh, Playmaker, which is also uh, also really great, but it's um, it's a different logic. You know, it's a state machine logic, and it's uh, conceptually quite different from traditional scripting, which sometimes it makes things like very efficient, and sometimes it's really hard to do with that. Um, again, you know, you notice the multitasking. I'm just clicking around and telling something, <laughs> but uh, why don't we just um, Press play and see how it is, and maybe do some cuts because we have three cameras now. That should oh, be hey, fine. Mm, Harold, is everything okay? Okay, maybe here I would jump to Harold. 
Well, sometimes I, I even make the first track super long because you know it's always the top, the the most, the track at the bottom that that gets uh, chosen. Is everything okay? Too proud to the school and the social district is out. Um, I, I just pressed S to make a cut here. Oh, right. Makes sense. Annoying. annoying. That's not what's annoying. Oh? Kids. Everywhere. All, all the time. No school means no peace. They're just hanging around. Taking space. Yeah. Playing. All They're just hanging around. Taking space. Playing all the arcades. Oh dear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And often, usually, I start with you know these basic things, and then. Uh, one, once I'm, once I'm, uh, I like the cut. I, I edit, uh, I cut this too and put it in one line. So I could have as many as I want, but usually I like, you know, to compress things. Once, once I'm done with that, so you can see I'm quickly going through this, uh, almost one minute long or so. No, oh, that was the wrong thing. Doesn't matter actually. Um, yeah, so that's that's really a quick process. Isn't that what this place is for? Kind of? Oh. I see. Good luck. <laughs> okay, that should be fine for today. Um, exactly. So let me place this in the end, actually. Good luck. Okay, so um, yeah, let's watch the whole thing. Oh, hey, Rafi. Mm, Harold. Is everything okay? The tube route to the school in the social district is out. Oh, right. Makes sense. Annoying. That's not what's annoying. Oh? Kids. Everywhere. All the time. No school means no peace. They're just hanging around. Taking space, playing all the arcades. Oh dear, but isn't that what this place is for? Kind of. Oh, I see. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, two more things. So uh, we uh, now that I don't need it anymore, I would disable the preview track here. In any case, for any case, but, but, but another thing I would usually do is to um, add head turn clips. Again, this is a custom custom track from Adventure Creator that I extended with some useful features like showing some details on the clip about, you know, where a character is looking at and specifically for our. So I would choose um, Hacker. Yeah, you can see uh, now Harold is targeting Rafi, and I would just place them in a way so that the eye, uh, the, the look at of the eye and the little slight IK correction of the head and so on would be accurate. This would take too much time right now, but you know, I would uh, set it up basically. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so basically it. Then I would just, just, uh, oops apply these here and one step i still have to do before we can actually watch this in game in complete like full with facial animation by the way you will notice that the the looks will be a little bit off now because i didn't place the look at track yeah. but um so i will go back to that you know very first thing i showed you this action list where I said it is basically just playing the timeline and setting the variable after that. 
and even this is created by that that tool basically from the RTC variable variable. So what I'm going to do is basically tell it play this timeline here and um, that's pretty much it. So I can now say and normally I would also have to set up when this thing is spawned. So right now I'm just saving it in the scene so it's already there. Oh, I did a big mistake now, by the way. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not too bad, but obviously I, I saved the scene while the characters were at this spot. So, uh, and this one shouldn't be there at all. I can just delete it. It's what's just spawned to work on that. And if I would play it now, Harold, Harold's animation would have mm. offset. I actually had that when uh, looking at it before. So I'm just reworking it to the which didn't work. Oh, no, because it's still in the, yeah. Okay, this looks good. So <laughs> While we're waiting for the scene to set up, I'd like to give a super special shout out to Lana Lux and all of her viewers who just rated us with uh, over 200 viewers. So welcome. Welcome. All, welcome all the new people. Lana Lux is another Unity dev and she's making her really great game. So go check out her channel, follow her and see out her game development journey as well. But hopefully, hopefully everyone from Lana the stream can learn something here. We're right now showing off uh, the great Slow Bros team and their game Harold Halibut. So I hope yeah. you're learning something. We were just we just built a cutscene together. They were showing us how they, they staged the uh, all the cutscenes in their games. We're using timeline to do that. And after that, we're going to jump more into the art and aesthetic. And we're going to conclude this stream with a look at their studio where they actually build all the uh, physical assets. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> you have arrived. Please exit the tube Whoa. in an orderly manner. Great to see this with the audio. Us again soon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Snippy. Oh no, that's the wrong place. No, stop it. <laughs> 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 but because uh, it's another scene, you know, so it takes a while now to load that other scene mm -hmm. and come back. But Oh, I've just That's seen okay. a question. Okay. Do you animate while well, well, we are waiting for Unity? Do you animate in Do you create the animation prior to import it into the cutscene? Well, for the character animation, we create it prior. So we are motion capturing all the animations. Actually, one room um, aside from this room, basically. It's just, you know, we, we, we built two of our tables. We can show that later on like little wheels. So we can move them away to make some little space for the motion capturing process um and yeah that's where we capture the animations and then they are basically set up in motion builder so and, and cleaned up and then we in, import the full completed animation clips um then there are some little things that we also animate inside of unity which is like um doors for example so if it's like simple keyframe animation like mm -hmm. sliding door open door closed i sometimes do them you know usually it was just like okay we have some placeholder animation but we kept them for the last six years or so so probably it's not going to change yeah <laughs> so i have another that, question I, is that, that is there any there add event function in timeline to... like in the animation tab oh sorry i think our voice um, started well, to... Well, there are timeline signals that um the voices sorry go ahead go ahead is it okay can you hear me yeah yeah okay okay um well yes there, there are the timeline signals which we use for for example what do we use it for actually i know yeah, there is a it's not a spoiler there is a submarine where we switch between different uh driving modes <laughs> okay. and mm -hmm. we can use timeline signals for that the cool thing with timeline timeline signals is that uh yeah it's pre pretty much like you the events arrived. actually you add them to any track the and the with the, based we on the track you you edit to 
you actually target you actually target the object that, mm. that is bound to that track. Mm -hmm. It's eight to zero nine. Yeah, that's the right one. <laughs> so we can run through that scene now. Did we lose them? Have they frozen? I don't know. Oh, we can't hear Kyle. Kyle, yeah, I think you're muted. Sorry. I, yeah, I think yeah. we're losing them a little bit because the iPad's probably heating up at this point. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's super uh, crazy. <laughs> but can you yeah, hear Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. So. Okay, great. Okay, so we are back in the game. Let's let's uh, walk there, and hopefully it's all connected and works. Oh, hey, Ryan. lighting's like, kind of broke. Uh, Harold, is, is everything okay? The team route to the school huh? and the social district is out. Oh, right, makes sense. Annoying. That's not what's annoying. Oh, kids. Everywhere, all the time. No, no school means no peace. You're just, just hanging around, taking space, playing all the arcades. Oh dear, but isn't that what this place is for? Kinda. Of? Oh, I see. Good luck. Yeah, thankfully we were just done with the timeline, so um, yeah, that's fine. So so I was just talking about how we're now going to be looking at like the te the textures in the game, right? So we're yes. talking about how you know everything is physically made. There are a lot of, there are a lot of high resolution textures in the game, and so of course you need to achieve. So, you know, if everything is a four K texture, it's going to be hard to optimize that, right? So you have some solutions for that, and you're going to show us how <laughs> how that's yes. been achieved. Yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at that. Yeah. yeah, so one one thing with the real world models is that um, we don't have something like, you know, a little wallpaper that is uh, used across all the walls in the game that is a mm -hmm. tiling texture. I mean, in fact, none of our textures is a tiling texture. Maybe there mm -hmm. is one or two in the whole game. I, I don't want to say none of them, but yeah. Um, we we used a little trick for this carpet, for example, which is only a half the size. You can almost see it's mirrored in, in between. But, you know, it's like just just like little things like we don't have like real tiling anywhere, um, which makes a lot of, you know, the, the variety of all those things. Mm -hmm. um, so and you can see in the same time that we have a lot of detail. Um, in them so I'll, for example this is one of the interesting um examples you can see the amount of detail that that is there in all those textures where you can right. actually see all those physical detail that we created and it was important for us to keep that and um this texture alone for example the facade of the general store is an 8k texture and you can imagine um, especially if you're targeting consoles and not or or tar targeting anything else than high-end PC, PC graphics cards, yeah, it's uh, pretty much impossible to go with this amount of high-res textures because we have like several 8K textures in the game and all the other textures are pretty much 4K. That's like the smallest. Uh, we have a couple of them that are smaller, but like the majority of our textures is 4K. Same, by, by the way, here, you get close to, to that. You can see, like, the whole structure of the aluminum foil and, you know, these little, all these little details that were really important for us. Um, so one way, and, and, what, and it really was a problem. We, we had a, um, memory problems for quite a while until uh, we were using another virtual texturing tech before but now that it's included in user unity it's like really nice i'll just enable the debug tiles so you can mm -hmm. see that so um basically all our textures are streamed in through uh, what's called virtual textures um what happens is basically pretty much everything in the game gets 
put into one huge texture um, and every single piece of um, or, or all these textures that we have are basically cut into little slices. So um, during gameplay, the system checks what is actually visible. And usually, you know, in a, in a normal, you can see, for example, Harold is traditional texture right now. When we see Harold's texture here, even though we don't see the other side of the character, the whole texture is rendered or, or is in, in the memory because it's just one file. And because um, all our other textures here are split into like little 128 by 128, sized um snippets mm -hmm. um we don't have to load the whole texture and can dynamically stream them in and out so you can see you know if i get closer to something i load in the tiles with a, a lower mip so um i get more detail there you can even see the, uh, the textures getting let's let's see if we can uh see that for example oh you can see them popping in if i got did you see that? I yeah. don't know if, if you can capture that on the stream, but you can actually see how they get uh, sharper when you come close to them. Mm. And uh, the further you get back, the less less detail you need and you load in um, the, the higher MIPS. Now, of course, this is like traditional MIP mapping, but the, the main, main, main thing with that is, for example, some, for something like the floor, as I said before, or things that you only partially see on screen, um, you would normally choose a specific MIP of this whole floor because we can already see the parts that are closer here to the camera. These things, the whole texture would be rendered in this quality. And now it's only like this front parts and you can see from here it gets to, to a higher MIP and so on. And this makes it possible to actually set a certain amount of um, memory we want to spend on the textures and um and so we can basically say we just want to use 512 megabytes of uh texture memory and it will be constant throughout the whole game no matter how many objects or how many different things we render because it's yeah all fetched in screen space based on what the camera sees and yeah this, this really helps Wow, mm. that's really actually that's really clever because that's the one thing that we were like, man, this is staggering. When you said 8K, I think a chat was like, <gasps> yeah. <laughs> and, then, yes. and then immediately asked, uh, I, Tron Volta asked, um, are you using Atlas or just one massive Atlas? Oh, it's actually that, that's the nice thing. All our textures are just normal textures or texture sets. I will show you, for example, the general structures. You can see a lot of things there. So. In this case, this whole facade is one texture, but not, uh, so we didn't put everything into one atlas. That's the nice thing. So uh, the virtual texturing system basically does that for you. Mm. Um, so mm -hmm. if you look into, into the texture of the um, wow. general store. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love I looking love, at I those. I love seeing these. <laughs> Me too. I just love these. So, <laughs> you just frame this and put it up on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's make this a little bit bigger. Yeah, that looks nice. Okay, so that's the general store. Um, there's a base color of the general store. We also have obviously all those channels. So we have a normal map. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, that's the band normal. Uh, so we have the mask map that, you know, contains all the ch different channels. Um, yeah, the one I'm missing. So the, the roughness and we have the metallicness here. Um, the green channel would be AO, which we don't use in this case. And the detail mask, I think. Yeah. So these are empty. But then we also have the normal map here. And... Um, yeah, that's that's just for the front of the general store. But then, for example, you can already see these are all the uh, general store textures. So we have one for the floor and the ceiling. Um, again, this is this one is 4K. I think the other one, this one was no, it's also just just 4K. Um, and yeah, and this go, goes like that. So we have textures for 
every single one of those objects has one texture set. For example, this. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so the virtual texturing system actually puts all those into one gigantic atlas itself. So we don't have to care for actually arranging them. And also we can quickly disable and enable virtual texturing. For example, we technically our characters um, were also running with virtual texturing uh, stuff. The problem is that um, since it's still in an experimental stage, addressables aren't supported right now. And as we are loading in our char characters from addressables, in, it, it looked perfectly in the editor actually, but in our builds, all the characters were just, you know, uh, black. They didn't have any textures. And um, yeah, so we <laughs> decided to traditionally texture them for now. Um, yeah. But once, once uh, you know, the update comes and we can use virtual texturing for them. It's basically just a checkbox and uh, we can also use virtual texturing for them. Um, Chat is laughing about the fact that you, <laughs> that you quote said, just 4K textures. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> Oh, keep yeah, turning into a meme in chat. Yeah. This, this is an 8K one, you see. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can. Yeah. Is this nip level two looks still? Can I zoom in? Isn't there a zoom function here? Actually, I don't know. Well, yeah, you can imagine. Um, it's quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a really great uh, solution to, to optimizing with all the with all the texturing, especially in the unique way that you're doing it. And that just goes to show, like, there's no one solution for, like, it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. It really depends on what kind of game you're making. And I think you had a very uh, unique problem to solve, and this was like, just the right way to, <laughs> just the right way to do it for you, right? Um, yeah. And I, I would love to jump to looking at the the lighting in the game um yes of course and and then the, the way that that's achieved and so there's of course like a mix of techniques that are used for the lighting and you know i would love to look at like uh different lights and different scenes in the games and maybe you can break that down break it down for us sure yeah uh, in fact i'm just baking lighting really quickly nice. I, I usually because i think it broke before when i was switching the scenes so that i don't know why I'm also on the current beta, which, by the way, is super stable, but maybe this is one of those little, you know, it's still not a released <laughs> version of Unity thing. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that was the reason why it was so slow, because I think all the lights were suddenly set to, uh, so I, I lost the baked data kind of when we switched mm. scenes before. So, because um, I was wondering, I looked into the console and it was like, uh, okay, you have too many shadow casters, which I know can't be true because we baked a lot of stuff. Right. So I'm quickly baking it. By the way, I did that before too. Uh, I can recommend to everyone, you know, usually, by the way, the GPU light mapper itself is super fast anyway, but I usually set it to something lowish that totally depends, by the way, um, per scene. We have smaller scenes where something like 20 is already fast enough in this case i set it for 14 it just takes two minutes or so to bake the lighting lighting data yeah. um so i can all uh, recommend everyone to set this quite low during production because you know you're constantly changing things yep yeah, that's it basically you know um so it's now exporting all that data and uh the lighting should be fixed again Okay, what I want to show you is that um, when I when we started, actually, I, I started to light everything like I would light a film, which, you know, visually is still the approach, but technically it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So what I was doing is, for example, if we have these, have these uh, street lights that you have seen, this one in the picture right now, you will see it in a minute. Um, so these, these like circular street lights it's um obvious that you would use a point light for that but i quickly realized or you know through experience and through reading about things 
that, uh, for example, one point light is basically like six spotlights. And that means if you have a shadowed point light, that's like six shadowed spotlights. So using point lights pretty much everywhere, which was what I did in the beginning, because in yeah. the real world, we only have point lights. You know, even the spots are point lights and a reflector, a reflector basically. Um, that's, yeah, was, it was stealing so much performance that the game wouldn't have run on anything. Um, <laughs> and then, so, so it was, a, on the other hand, I, it was hard to recreate the effect I wanted to have uh, of, you know, <laughs> what, the, what, what the point lights actually do with spotlights because people say yeah use spotlights but it's not so easy you know you can't just replace <laughs> point lights by spotlights and call it a day because it will totally look different depending on what you do it works for a flashlight it might work for a lamp like this i'm going to show that to you in a bit um too so um then I, I i learned about you know when looking into other lightning artists work that a lot of people actually and even looking at other games uh it, it was exciting to see that often in uncharted i didn't see one more than one uh shadow casting light yes because um the the character models and all the environments are like so you know uh so detailed that there is no budget for more than right. one shadow casting light often thankfully yeah. we have more than one shadow casting light. I budget for more than one shadow casting light because you know it's an essential part of our game. Um, but yeah, we quickly started um, to combine different light types. So we have, we always have um, baked lights, and then, then sm some small real-time lights, then some that are casting shadows. And I will walk you through those things in a bit. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> When, when, when Unity, um, stop saying I should hold on. <laughs> Again, like I said, it's a huge project. Okay, it's yeah. there. There we go. We made it. No, not nope. yet. Nope, <laughs> surprise almost, loading bar. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? <laughs> it, it was a joke. It, it, quick tease. <laughs> quick tease. <laughs> Unity loves all those 8K textures. What can we say? <laughs> yes, true. Um, actually, Benson Coolfy asked uh, a question earlier. I know, like, we can't jump into the link, but they didn't totally get what you were trying to explain in terms of, like, um, you know, how you actually did the textures. They like, did you scan the normal map? Um, yeah, it's, uh, yes, because you know, when we 3D scan our models, maybe this might have think so. Yeah. We are actually bringing one in because we have the general store right here on the shelf. Nice. So oh, that. perfect. Yeah. Um, Give a sneak peek. So don't let it fall down. <laughs> oh. <Okay. laughs> don't traumatize me. Coming with the facade of the general store. That's oh my god, <gasps> it's real oh, and it's so big. Wow. It's surprisingly big. Oh wow, yeah, that's humongous. Yeah. <laughs> so why why that size? <laughs> um, it, it's a one I love the way Ola just scale, came in. <laughs> um, <to, laughs> you know, because of consistency, um, yeah. we decided to try to follow a certain scale. So all our, um, basically all our sets are in a one to 10 scale. Mm. So uh, 10 centimeters in the, or in the real world are basically a meter in um our game mm. um the care we built the characters slightly bigger than that to have more detail and we have other areas of the game where things just got so huge that we had to build them in a smaller scale but usually they are also further away but right. we try to keep all of uh, most of the things at a one to ten scale because of the consistency in detail yes because you see okay. the brush strokes and things like that you know and then that makes sense so when we scan something like that um, in the 3D scan, uh, the, the resultant 3D scan will have like 10 millions of polygons. And we ob obviously have all the surface detail that we then uh, recreate a low poly model out of that and um, bake all those details from the high poly model to the low poly model in form of normal maps. Um, so yeah, th that's that. And we also, there are some things obviously that 
especially some of on some of the metal surfaces some sometimes we had problems in the details in the scan so there is quite a lot of rework also done um, digitally you can imagine it like you know fixing stuff with the healing brush in photoshop or so mm. and sometimes adding micro details through you know extracting stuff from the base color so it's a mix of a lot of techniques that we also do in the the digital processing of all our both scan data and texture texture data to um yeah to basically get the um finished textures nice thank you <laughs> all the slides yeah. away slowly yeah. yes <laughs> chat okay. asks when you will auction off I was pieces. thinking the exact same thing. I'm like, what are you going to do with all these pieces? And how do I get my hands on it? Yeah, we we have a lot of plans, actually. Honestly, we were thinking about having our, um, our release party combined with some kind of um, exhibition <gasps> and yes. a live. That'd be amazing. So, um, yes. This, this would be a dream for us. Because, you know, also, again, one thing of different backgrounds and a, a lot of us are also involved in design in general and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we, we were always imagine it, you know, like the, the initial big presentation of the finished game as something like more than just a game, basically, because there is so yeah. much to it. So an exhibition where we could see like all those or ex exhibit like all those models together with the game itself and then some live music out of the game would be our ideal. Um, yeah plan for a, for a release party i love that so it's because it is essentially a big multimedia project yeah pretty much yeah, yeah. and then yeah an auction maybe <laughs> maybe um start saving starts saving <laughs> <laughs> um, um yeah so we were yeah, looking light. at the lighting yeah exactly sorry we got so, distracted but thanks for the great question no no, no. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thanks. Good question. Okay, I'll, I'll start with this one, for example. No, not this one. This one. They, they look, by the way, this is again, you know, one thing. <laughs> one of the reasons why this game took so long, you know, because these guys, and I mean, Ole and Fabi, you saw before, they were like, uh, you know, wait, 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 we have to build another lamp. For the, the for for the scene, and I was like, yeah, but we have a hanging lamp, and they were like, no, it's slightly different because this one has this round shape up there, and this one there, and we even I have, you know, it. sometimes sometimes we have different colored <laughs> things, the same thing twice. Actually, we have that with uh, you see this. Uh, how do you call this? Um, cash register. Uh, what? Cash register. Yeah. 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 This cash register is not the same cash register as you have. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. As this one. I don't know why we needed I don't know why we needed two cash registers. They you know, if you don't even notice it. It's really uh, Ola just has a lot of free time. Look, look at, look at this. Okay, this. I love that he's just laughing one. like like See, I <laughs> <laughs> can, can you can you spot the differences? Well, there are slight differences, but no, no, I, I noticed the differences. It's it's effort yeah. well spent. Effort yeah. well spent. I really, yes. I honestly, really appreciate that. That's yeah. so great. Please chat. Uh, point out all the differences. Is it a game now? Or yeah. you can cut cut all no the... corners. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, finally, people have noticed that there are two different cash registers, <laughs> and we are not using them anywhere else. By the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it does. It does. Uh, ob obviously, we are using some duplicate stuff, but the not the cash register. For example, things like bottles and so on. And right. You know, are the all are all those logic. stools over there the same stool? Yeah. Yes, they oh, are. How disappointing! But, but these these no, chairs are different again. You know? <laughs> oh, even, they are. even even though we don't see the surface of them when we look from here. That's by the way one of those things. Mm. This this floor flooring here it's a rare view here because probably in the or in the game you will only see this bit of it unfortunately and it took like three days to make because they uh, actually you will see that in the making of video uh, in a bit and we were also sad or, and also the space were sad to to hear that it's uh yeah basically covered 
Mm. But that's again the thing, you know. But because of that, this thing of not thinking about how things are specifically built for what we see, a lot of things got, you know, so nice and detailed. And even though it's sometimes only this one, or in the cutscenes, of course, you, you see some parts of it. Um, that's fine. It, it gives like all that detail. That it, uh, you can already even see like the oh you know this is a part that we don't see <laughs> too by the way so um this were our, our uh basically our we, we numbered all our sets to you know find all the parts and so on so i love how that shows see. up in the game that's so great yeah yeah okay so but back to the lights this one yeah um okay so so um, we have the light bulb of it, which um, uh, which which is an emissive object. Let's actually disable all those um, individual lights so we can see the bare bones thing. So um, this is basically the lamp as it looks like when it's. Um, I mean, it has baked lighting on it right now, which is why it still has a little bit of lighting also here but uh that's which is why i would start with the baked light first so um i'm using a baked light baked like light here for example just to give it um a lot of that emissive a lot of that bounce lighting inside this room um and also so we basically light the dark spots on on our main characters who are dynamically lit off obviously but also yeah. lit by light probes so that we don't have like black sides for example like very dark spots because it wouldn't make sense uh in in this room sometimes it we want that like harsh lighting um then we have the real-time spotlight which actually casts all those shadows um let's actually drag where is Harold? Let's drag Harold there so we can see a little bit of the shadow stuff. Okay, so um, the real time spotlight that also casts the shadows, and I'm actually also going to enable the the um, gizmos. And you can see that it's not like super wide angled because we wanted to throw you know that that nice shape on the wall. Um, give enough shadows of Harold. It also doesn't have too much of a length. It's really as as small as it can be, so it's as cheap as it can be. Um, baked lights, for example, you will see that in another example here. It's pretty much the same. Um, we have a real time point light, which in this case is um, on the on a specific li light layer, so it only lights the lamp itself, and it's just for lighting the bottom side of this light and then we have a separate light that's there for that volumetric effect and as you can see for example this one is much wider because um the if if the volumetric effect of it would be as um as uh narrow as the actual light you would actually see this and we wanted to start the lines at um, yeah the edge of the lamp, which is why we basically separated the volumetric effects. And this light, as you can see, is set to not cast any diffuse or specular lighting, but only the volumetric light. So um, that way we have like the maximum control um, on you know all, all the lighting setup itself. We have a similar situation here with the these were the street lights I was talking about. Ideally, I would have used um, mixed point lights, so if you have like the bounce light, that's another thing. By the way, we are using um, shadow masks, which again saves a lot of performance. Now, um, with shadow masks, you have the problem that you can't have more than four overlapping lights that are um, rendered into the shadow mask. So uh, you really have to take care if, you know, for example, I know that in this room there are already those four, which is uh, why I used shadow, I used mixed lights for all those individual rooms. Um, but I couldn't make all those um, street lights basically 
also mixed because then some of them would fall back to fully baked. So to have the control over them, I let them uh, disabled mixed slides there, but instead go, went for a combination again. So in the case of those, oops, yeah, the ticking, ticking is still not the, it got better, still not the best. <laughs> um, so yeah. Again, we have, in this case, we have a huge, you can see it here, a huge baked point light, you know, because we want this, this whole area to be quite lit from, you know, all the bounds of all those, um, all, all those lights in general that are here. Um, and then we have a spotlight that is much smaller and much narrower just for the character shadows again. Let's bring the character in there so you can see it. So, yeah. Now, if we would only use that, that spotlight, no, no, that was the wrong light. Where is it? Yeah. Now, if you would only use the spotlight, you would have like edges where basically uh, you, you would notice where the spots end and so on. But by adding, you know, uh, baked point lights to it, both we extend the range of the lights in general and also add nice um, bounce light that is uh, also captured in the light probes. So the characters, the, the not directly lit parts of the characters still get some light. And then again, um, there is a volumetric part to it too. You can see this is disabled, this is enabled. Um, Oh, and you, you will notice that uh, by doing, you know, this mix, we even had the freedom to place the actual light that, that throws the shadow, the, the real-time light, basically, a little further to the top. The reason for this is also um, very simple. Um, the wider the angle of spotlights get, the, the worse the shadow resolution gets here. Um, let's see if I can show it without breaking. Uh, yeah. It might not work right now because I'm also, I've set them to update on enable. Um, so this shadow map is basically just rendered once and then only updated when a dynamic object comes in there, like the character, because all of that stuff is static. So we, we are mix, mixing, uh, mixing everything to create both, you know, nice looking, but still efficient lighting. Yeah. That's basically to sum, sum it up. Yeah, no, I, I think like, you know, when, you, when you're playing through a game or you're thinking about how developers put things together, you see a light, you assume it's just one light achieving everything. Yeah. And then when, you, when it comes time to actually make a game yourself, you put the light in and it's just not working the way you expect it or it's uh, costing you too much. And it's great to see that you've broken one light down into so many different components so that you can achieve that control, actually. Um, yeah. Optimi optimization, shadows, oh, right. volumetrics, and achieve the aesthetic that you're looking for. So that's it's really One more insightful. Interesting thing, yeah. Yeah. That's exactly that. One more interesting thing in general that we noticed, especially using HDRP, HDRP is actually really fast in rendering lots of lights. So we often use, you know, as long as you don't, as those lights are not shadowed, you can you literally use hundreds of them and we have we have scenes where we really use lots of lights um as effect lights for example lights that are flying around in other areas of the game which would be spoilers i if i would talk about that we even have some here for example just to give that little nice you know um right. greenish yellowish shine to that actually let me show that to you um if i where is it should be here somewhere. If I disable the gizmos. Weird. It, it seems to be here, but I don't see the gizmo. Well, never mind. But you can see there is a light in here. There's a, yeah, there's there a, a glowing light. light. Yeah. This. Yeah. And um, things like that. And you know, as long as these lights are not throwing shadows, you can have dozens of them. Um, but you have to be really careful with shadowed light and try to mostly use spotlights for that. 
right? Uh, and, and when it comes to other kinds of lights, such as neon lights or like there's lab scenes where there are little blinking lights, you've achieved, you've done that in a completely different way. What, looking at this, when I first saw this, I assumed it was, you know, a mesh with some emissive uh, lights, and it's an animation where you're turning on and off the emissive layers, right? But apparently not. You've achieved this in a really <laughs> unique way that you're going to show us. Yes, it's, yeah. it's very interesting, actually. Yeah. Um, this is basically a light step sequence, I would say. It's, it's just a shader, a very easy shader. It was, I think it was the first shader graph I made. Because I'm, uh, again, um, I, I, I didn't do any shader programming, traditional shader programming, so I wouldn't have been able to. Because it's something different than regular programming, right? Because I know so many programmers who can't program shaders. It's quite different. They're different. And so for this one, um, I will show you the texture. That's basically where the interesting thing starts. So this is the texture of this thing. Now you might ask, okay, why do we have the same color duplicated? And, you know, um, the reason for that is that we have two important channels for this or the RGB channel, basically the color. And for this object, we have placed the individual parts. Um, it's not unwrapped in a traditional way, but we have placed each color on just on an area and on a certain spot of this texture. And if you look at the alpha, no, that was my, sorry, that was the wrong one, this one. Mm -hmm. If you look at the alpha channel of this, all right, this is where it gets interesting. Inside our shader graph, what we are doing is basically just scrolling the texture that is in the alpha channel and multiplying it with the emission. So if it's black, that means the emission will be zero, so it's off. If it's white, the emission will be to the the value that we have set, set it to be. And this scrolls from left to right. And it's actually, uh, you will understand how it works when you imagine uh, like now, um, Uh, wait. Yeah. So you can see it blinks, 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 and then blinks three times. And this is the three times blinking yeah. thing. So if you imagine this thing scrolling with a constant speed, like my mouse does now, you can you can imagine this blinking process here. It's uh, it might be really hard to. It, it's actually a very easy technique, but yeah. Um, so uh, so what's scrolling really is the UV. The unwrap exactly. is moving across and it's just flashing with the black and white and that's tied to the emission and that's yeah. that. No, I think it's clear. I think that's, that's very clear. And also uh, the nice thing with that is, for example, I could change the animation just by, you know, changing, for example, the, the texture here. Um, or uh, we could um, reuse some textures for, you know, in this case, it's a very specific thing, but it gets like really interesting when we move to another part, which is in the all water district. Um, there is a cockpit uh, location. Maybe it gets clearer there. Um, and we have lots of blinking lights there. Uh, and we are actually reusing all those blinking lights everywhere. And instead of going into every single like emissive object and animating the emission um we are all doing we are doing all of this in the shader <laughs> um for all those cockpit lights too so yeah our 3d mastermind <laughs> yeah. is prepared <clears throat> again a, a texture that contains the colors and also well here we are you can okay. notice the textures loading in so if you look awesome at this, looking room by the way <laughs> yeah yeah i'll show it like this really cool. so you can you can see like all these different lights here's one, one of them is blinking some aren't they have different speeds these seem to be scrolling and yeah there's all this variation we get in there some are constantly blinking there is stuff happening here you could you can imagine how much how long it would take to animate all those in that chaotic uncontrolled fashion and in fact um it's again the same principle and they all share one texture and they are just placed on different areas of this texture. 
Okay. <laughs> so this is the base color. It, depending on you know the the color of the that we want them to blink, we place them somewhere. So this is obviously a green light. Oh, this is a really really fast one. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. These these are like going crazy. <laughs> And uh, then again in the alpha channel, it's this. There you go. That's the blinking right are. there. Yeah. Oh, different and you can see some fading. Blinking, so, yeah. yeah. And you can see this is basically different blinking speeds. If you place something here, let, let's look in the color again. So I, let's say I want to have a blue light, blue light that blinks, you know, slowly. I use the like upper row somewhere. Um, and then. The second row is twice as fast. The third row is uh, quadruple as fast. And then it goes on like that. And then also by oops, by placing all these uh, individual UVs on different parts from left, left to left, uh, left to right, I kind of offset their mm -hmm. starting point. Yeah. So that makes it really easy to, you know, just, just move around the UVs and create like chaotic lighting <laughs> right. and we can use this this whole thing for all the blinking lights in the game and it's Probably easy to, more to, to sync than, them up know, too them. yes yes yeah exactly yeah uh, per i personally haven't seen um this method used before so seeing this for the first time was uh eye-opening for me uh, and again, another way to just like another creative solution to something that you'll see often in games um and i think that's the thing about this game it's just uh a, a treasure trove of creative solutions to achieve this unique <laughs> aesthetic um you're gonna show us another shader now i think which is the uh maybe a shader that you use often when zooming in and out of scenes which is this fade and maybe we're gonna look at the graph of that yes yeah oh yeah sorry i didn't show you i mean i can't i can't show you the graphs for that but it's uh um especially with the with the blinking thing yeah I, mm -hmm. you can already see it here in the editor so you know uh, for a long for a long time this was a problem actually we have this beautifully built front of the agora arcades but you know they were they didn't look nice when we were zoomed in and they were always in the way yeah and then also just disabling them when getting closer didn't look nice so i wanted a more dynamic effect you have seen it before you know when i when i come closer to it, they they kind of reappear again and then they, they disappear again so um this is a shader i created for that based on you know the distance let's let's actually look into that um actually that's that's also the nice thing even though shader graph is easy to use a lot of conceptual things about shaders I didn't even know before um, and it's you know through looking into other shader graphs that's the nice thing even if you don't have an idea on how to do it by yourself you will see a tutorial of someone doing something similar like this for URP and then you can you just grab the part of you know measuring the distance to yeah to uh, create a distance-based effect. And I didn't like, for example, I, sh I saw a tutorial like this and I didn't like the way it was blending out the the objects, but then I used another effect for that, which is dithering in our case, um, and combined it with other features that I needed. So you can mix and match shaders that are out there and everyone is sharing their graphs. And by the way, you probably yeah, we're lucky have to have such seen. a vibrant community. Yeah, you have probably never seen graphs as tidy as these. Oh yeah, because <laughs> I'm like some really, OCD I'm, happening over here. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> OCD graph. So, <laughs> OCD graph. Um, oh, this this is the wrong one, by the way. Is it the? Yeah, that's the wrong one. I don't know. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> but they are all as tidy. <laughs> <That's> why, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just want to show off. Um, okay, Burns and Cool Fee says makes art even from that. Yeah, even even the shader graphs are art. <laughs> <laughs> Sunflower asked, I think you mentioned it, but I, I might have uh, missed it. Are you using Bakery for the bakes or Unity's own light mapper? Um, during, you know, working on it, I'm using the GPU light mapper. Um, 
I have downloaded, bought and downloaded um, Bakery, which I heard is great. And I did some test bakes, but I didn't have too much time to look into that. I guess for the final bakes, we are going to use that, especially that since they also have uh, 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 live preview now, like kind of live preview, I think. Um, like like the progressive light, light mapper. Um, I noticed that the bakes themselves were like very, very clean, which I really liked. Um, but especially, you know, during these stages where I, during lighting setup and so on to have a quick overview, it's still faster to get a very first glimpse with the <laughs> GPU light mapper. Again, um, I definitely have to look into that in more detail. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. Sorry, it's again the my most multitasking difficulties. But I guess I have it now. <laughs> yeah, it's not a it's not a unity stream without the a pepper bark in the background. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's a staple. I'm disappointed if Pepper doesn't show up. <laughs> oh yeah, there it is. VT lit distance fade. So by the way, um, there is another... Hassan, may, may you, do you have a link for that actually? That was really helpful. Because um, we talked about that, uh, you know, shortly before the stream. The... Um, what I used as a base for a lot of my shader graphs, because I wanted to actually have the all the features or most of the features of the HD RP lit shader, um, was a recreation. Someone, I think, someone from Unity actually did of the um, HD RP lit shader in shader graph. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was really helpful because. Um, I didn't want to create a shader, but then miss like all the nice things and the flexibility of the HRP lit shader. So I used that as a base and put a lot of them, those individual elements into subgraphs and tidied them up. I was actually planning to upload them, maybe maybe uh, fork that Git repo or so. So you you might also have a tidier version of that soon. <laughs> um, is it? it I should still open the wrong one. Sorry, I'm so bad at shader. Okay, no. Okay. So, it's this shader. This might lo look like very complicated at first, especially with like all those gigantic subgraphs, basically. But the thing is, uh, that's that's what I, um, to uh, why I told that. Most of this, it's basically this whole segment down there is just a recreation of the hdrp lit shader mm -hmm. and uh that's the base for most of my shaders and if i don't need specific features i i just delete them and i put a lot of things like the sampling the virtual texture stuff in a handy subgraph and also detail map related stuff in another sub subgraph so um i can reuse and tweak things but the actual you know unique things in this shader happen here I didn't tidy this up. That's yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> live OCD. Okay. I, I, sorry, I I, no. I almost started tidying it up now. <laughs> but yeah, so what happens here is um, again, you know, I learned this from another person on YouTube. Sorry that I don't mention you because I don't remember your name. But if you look at um, you, on you, if you on YouTube, you look at um, distance fade or something like that, you will see the exact same technique with exactly the same notes. Besides, of dithering was you know my change on that basically. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, so this one also doesn't even belong. This was something I replaced. Let's delete the unnecessary stuff. Oh, this one, yeah. So it's basically just this. This is all that makes it, uh, in case you want to screenshot that, <laughs> if you connect these um, the, uh, nodes to uh, the alpha channel of something, you will basically have the exact same effect. Um, I'm basically just measuring the screen position, splitting the position into individual channels. You basically have, uh, yeah, uh, different color channels. 
then uh, I have two two parameters that I can actually set in the inspector for you know the point at which I want the distance where I want to start the fade and the range over which the object is faded and these values are clamped and then because I don't want it to be faded like from you know it's on or off normally mm -hmm. I uh, subtract this dither node from that so uh, and the nice thing is that the dithering is again uh, based on the it, it's in screen space so it will always it will have always have the same fineness do you say that does a word like that same exist scale. yeah same scale basically based on yeah. the distance yeah and i'm just connecting that into the alpha channel so i okay. love this by the way you can tidy tidy all the nodes so they don't cross over each other it's <laughs> made for you yeah. <laughs> yeah. you can see I, I have to stop now with this <laughs> oh we don't actually need these here you can even delete unnecessary notes. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for anyone just joining, we're looking at the dither fade shader that was made for you know when the camera comes close to an object, having it fade away or fade back in when you go further away. And I'm pretty sure I threw in the right tutorial that you were looking at. Pretty sure it was made by Pablo Makes, so for Dither Shade, because um, it looks exactly like it. So. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> Great. Okay. So I want to okay. ask. Oh, sorry. You're going to zoom in and out, sure. Oh, no, I, I just said, okay, go oh, on. Okay. I thought you were going to show us the thing again. Um, so a lot of people are like shocked by how the game looks, about just the people saying, oh, this looks different than what I'm used to seeing. Uh, for anyone who's not aware, you're using HDRP, right? So I, I would like you to talk a little bit about that. Were you, I mean, you started 10 years ago, so obviously you weren't always in HDRP. You must have moved to HDRP at some point. So I'd love to know like, uh, what that transition was like, why you made that change, why not URP, um, and just give us a, yeah, your, your thoughts on this. Yeah, sure. So um, we moved to HDRP as early as we could move to HDRP. So that was a time where no one should have used HDRP, actually, especially in a running project. But, you yeah. know, there... We started with the default pipeline and it was fine because uh, we were extending quite a lot of it through other, all of the beautiful asset store plugins. In that time, there were quite a lot of posts. I mean, there wasn't even a post-processing stack in the beginning, you know, when we started with the with the game. Uh, but, you know, the the, um, the people from Amplify, uh, they, they had the super nice um, 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 ambient occlusion and also the Bloom, and there were a lot of Asset Store plugins we were using to actually achieve the look we wanted to achieve even then. Um, but there was still something off, you know, because everything is based on reality. And we actually have what, what I always do as a reference is, um, or it, now, now I got used to it, but in the beginning I was actually shining lamps on the real world objects seeing how they behave in different lighting conditions to get an understanding on how i want the lighting in the digital world to behave and work um and so the lights and unity in like in the default pipeline just weren't there where i wanted them to be in terms of achieving this like realistic um look um so i was super excited when i uh, and also performance wise you know once um it we we got to scenes where we had like lots of lights and like i said before i'm i have this film background i like to use like dozens of lights usually obviously i know there are some restrictions still um i heard that hdrp was especially efficient with that and like um targeted at high-end consoles and pc and at the time, it was uh, also the choice between, okay, staying with the default pipeline 
and uh, or HDRP or um, lightweight pi render pipeline. And mm -hmm. lightweight was basically the total of opposite. At that time, I think there was one shadowed light and no defer deferred rendering and so on. So for us, it was clear that either staying with um, the default pipeline or moving to HDRP. Um, so I quickly tried out, did some experiments actually at that time with HDRP and I knew it was broken, but I, uh, you know, it was like the, one of the earliest accessible versions. Like it was still three years experimental or so from that point or, or two years. It's, uh, just, if I don't mind my doing that. When we were at the Unite, I think this was like the first 218. Yeah, okay, 218. It's been only three years. Okay, so it was like maybe experimental for one and a half years, but it, it was right at like the, it was kind of, because a lot of the lighting I had done was only um, kind of very um, superficial in the beginning. It wasn't the final lighting of the game. It wasn't consisting of like all those different parts and so on. It was still relatively early in terms of that. And um, I thought like either we switch to a, the HD render pipeline now and uh, it will be broken for a while, but we don't have to show the game to anyone right now anyway. And we can start slowly doing the transition, relighting all the parts of the game. Or we will do it never because then at one point there is there is you know the time where you have like all those uh <laughs> all is playing with the mouse and got stuck somewhere um at one point you know you are already too far into the development they have to spend too much time making it pretty with for example the default pipeline that uh it would be too much often of work to to do the transition so in hindsight, it was the perfect time, even though a lot of things were like really broken visually in the beginning. But that is to be expected from from an exp experimental stage, you know. Um, but uh, we never even because even at that time, you could already imagine where it was going, both regarding there is that just this. I, I it's really hard to explain something with the colors that really changed the way the rendering itself worked the, uh, in film i would call it color science or so or the chemicals of the film you know the, besides of yeah, all the fancy stuff of you know all the post-processing effects and um volumetrics and so on even the way colors are rendered in hdrp was drastically different for my perception then it was in the default pipeline and I was blow, blown away from the first moment, despite, you know, all those early bugs. So, um, and the next test I did was like having dozens of lights in, and that also was, it has a high performance overhead. Um, so if you compare an empty scene in the default pipeline and an empty scene in the HD render pipeline, the default pipeline will be 10 times as fast, but that's not a fair comparison. You know, you have to put a yeah. hundred lights in both of them and like heavy stuff, and then you will see the difference. See. Then suddenly HDRP becomes a very performant pipeline. So it's not like um, now, for example, now we have the option, uh, the lightweight pi pi render pipeline uh, became the universal render pipeline, got more advanced. Um, and now if I would choose, I would still choose the HD render pipeline because that's exactly what we were, we are going for, or we are going for the best possible, like realistic lighting and graphics and so on. But depending on what game I make, I would also choose the universal render pipeline because it has, uh, has other st strengths. So it uh, depends if you only have like one light and, uh, are aiming for like, um, uh, it's. It's hard to say there. It, this is like this is the best one. It, it's like everything actually. It always depends on what you want to create, and um, yeah, for us, it was the perfect fit. Thank you for that de detailed <laughs> description. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's great. It's great to see to see the reasoning behind that decision, and uh, I think that comparison you made of like wait until the scene is filled with light. And then let's see how the then we'll yes. see the difference in performance, right? It's not evident right away until you put things into practice, um, which clearly you did. Um, 
So yeah, I think uh, I think that's it for looking inside the game. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at is the studio, the assets, all the like the physical stuff that you've built. You're going to give us a little tour of the studio. But before that, uh, we're going to take a little break. And when we come back, we're going to give you a little tour of the studio. So and also switch the microphones again, uh, the, the exactly. iPads again, because then we can walk around. Yeah. Yes. So we're going to take a five minute break, uh, bring back, uh, come back with your snacks and coffee. And we'll see you all very soon. Welcome Hello. back, everyone. I hope you brought your snacks and your treats. I have some nice chamomile tea and I have treats for Pepper since chat was so adamant about it. And I'm very sorry for her. And she's sitting right here already waiting. She's like, I know you have them. So I'll bring her. I'll just bring her I have two water. seconds. We have a show and tell. So there you go. Some treats for her. It's prosciutto. It's the fanciest of all the treats. Well, fancy dog. <laughs> fancy unity dog. <laughs> so nice. thanks to chat for setting up treats for the doggo so um for those who are just tuning in this is the awesome team right over here on at and Ona and Ola <laughs> um, from Slow Bros. <laughs> and um, we're at the point where we're going to see the making of because this is going to be a great little sneak peek into their actual workshop, which they're going to give us an exclusive tour. Is. So let's jump into the making of video right now. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, that video, it's so good we had to watch it twice, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that gives a glimpse into this beautiful world. I actually didn't see this video ahead of time, so I was like watching it very intensely and like, wow, this beautiful process and seeing all of you working on this. Um, so why don't you, also, yeah, go ahead. It, it also gives a glimpse on how old we got during the process, because <laughs> we were quite, quite young when when some of those shots were done like seven or eight years ago yeah. so. <laughs> nice he yeah. lost his hair i lost my hair <laughs> <laughs> that's just game dev for you there you go yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter how long your project is as long as you're making a game that's gonna happen <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Um, so you, would you like to just give us a little, we'll follow you along into your, uh, into your studio, sure. I guess. <laughs> nice. I'm yeah. grabbing this camera and switching it to the back side and let's see if this works. Okay. Can you see Ola now? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> let's go. Can you hear me okay as well? Yes. Can you? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, so the starting point is this long, one from left down, a physical game death. Actually, let me go. Yeah, I know. This is something we still have to rescan. Oh, wow. Uh, it's just been sitting behind us, sort of poking into our back. Cliffside. Yeah. yeah. We were actually thinking of making a boulder wall after that from from that stuff. <laughs> maybe maybe that would be an idea. Oh my gosh! Yes, please do that. <laughs> Carol's an avid climber. Get it into the light. Maybe. We showed this briefly earlier, but it's now for a bit of a feel. Maybe some people uh, join. In the Maybe Onat, you can tell us what's going on because we can not really hear Ola that well. Okay, so. yeah. It might also be that I'm covering the camera, 
but is it, is it better now with the with the audio uh i think ola's voice is a little low so ola might need to speak either speak up or come a bit closer <laughs> Closer and speak a little bit louder. Is this more understandable? There we go. There we go. Yeah. We can still switch to Ona. Oh, oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. There we go. The last try. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. That's uh, a good distance. A, give a good <laughs> sense. I hope this comes through on the stream, but um, let alone like all the different materials, because we do have like little uh, bricks that we made out of um, plaster at some point. There's a wooden frame, these panels are all metal that we nailed. Um, we cast some actual um, with, uh, concrete. Concrete, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just cast concrete, um, all the sign painting on the little wood panels. Um, and as you saw earlier, I'm sure this all like ultimately comes through thanks to the crazy textures <laughs> uh, and the normal map scanning and whatnot. And yeah, these are. <laughs> yeah, I moved to the other side. More complete um, bits because they're so two dimensional uh, for the most part, like the facade bits. Because um, you'll, I don't, I'm not sure how many rooms we have here. We have a lot of small assets, but a lot of the rooms consist of like individual walls. So sometimes it's a little abstract to, to understand them, but. These are pretty complete in, in themselves. And yeah, just, you can tell the amount of detail that we profit from um, on these things. These white bits are all um, glass, ultimately. These are like window fronts into the post office that this um, set becomes in the end. Okay. And a uh, thing to notice here, I guess, is the, again, the texture, these uh, painted like dirt bits that we we're able to bring into the texture in the end uh, on the see-through window. Yeah, so we, we are making these objects, uh, these parts transparent, or, but are still benefiting from basically the dirt on the texture and also from the roughness and normals. I don't know how good it is you can see that in, on the stream but yeah can imagine it so there is some structure on that as well so even for the glass bits which technically we can't scan glass which is why we don't build the glass but we still build the glass parts um and and make them transparent later on mm -hmm. and this is again like part of the physical um just picking up dirt and dust over time. Like we built the, the models and you know are just able to like smear uh, dust into them <laughs> that it, that it actually picks up and it adds to um, the look of the whole thing in the end. Yeah, I think it's really important. This is like a very much I think also a film thing where you want your worlds to look lived in. Like things that look yeah. too clean and tidy just doesn't feel right when you look at it. Yeah, and we figured, I guess, that you might as well lean into it while you're here. Like, while things are not, um, you know, perfectly 3D and rendered out. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Plenty of things to get into. The bees. It's that uh, sign that we saw earlier. In the beginning. Yeah, yeah, this is all yeah. stuff from the marketplace that we're mm -hmm. spending most of the time inside of. Um, we can also. Room. And there's another room. Yeah, yeah. Um, which has both our 3D scanning setup or like a version of it, at least for uh, illustration purposes. And behind that, the, all those boxes, and there's a bunch more boxes behind the black cloth. Mm -hmm. um, contains a lot of the, the small scale assets of the game. The rooms, all the actual sets to walk through, besides those facades we just saw, um, we had to box up and like basically put into a basement just because there's so much square footage that we're not able to like actually uh, keep it in, around. Outside. Yeah. Um, so those boxes are just filled with little lamps and desks and chairs and. 
they are like little props, <laughs> but, <laughs> which we're gonna take a look at soon. Yeah. 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 Here is here is nice to have Polka, by the way. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. Polka is a good friend of on, of ours who. Uh, usually works on another project, but we call him nice to have, have Volker because he always helps us out with all the things that aren't strictly necessary, but super nice to have. And we are so glad to have him. <laughs> <laughs> nice to have you here on the stream. With us. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you. I love that you actually got to your nice to have parts of your game. Most people are in the yeah. just putting out fires part of their game. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> It's a treasure chest, basically. Because again, the characters can actually be. So that's where all your characters yeah, and so everything are. Yeah. Cool. So we can't hear uh, Ola again. Maybe if you can come a bit closer to Ola. Yes. Yeah, we eventually managed to archive them away in this more respectful fashion. They used to like lie around the office <laughs> scattered about just according to whoever was working on what. <gasps> yeah, this is Harold. There Look he at is. Harold. <laughs> wow. The man of the hour. <laughs> Harold Halibut and so <laughs> yeah. you still got bendy knees. As I mentioned earlier <laughs> in the stream, uh the, Harold is the only character that is still like a stop motion puppet. Because we started out doing actual stop motion, where you know you move the model frame for frame to create movement. Um, yeah, and this he's got probably the highest level of uh, detail. So I remember you mentioning that this puppet uh, has actually been changing since the development of the game, right? So this is like the main prototype of it. True. Yeah. It is like a the ongoing. Um, Thing. Another bit about the um, very beginning was we were imagining um, to do facial animation. I think like via 2D as well, we we're going to like project the mouth onto uh, mm -hmm. the model and um, eyebrows as well, I think. Because um, that would, it would be like the static photograph face and then we would do most of the emotion um, through, yeah, some blinking eyebrow movement and, and mouth movement. So the original model didn't um, contain any of those. He didn't have eyebrows or mouth. I so see. we added those uh, later on. We redid the hands. He used to have really weird rubbery hands from a different <laughs> technique that we used. Um, and then the thing about the like, ongoing uh, changes is that you, you kind of have to um, adjust everything else to some, something you might have, uh, uh, you know, like once you, once you bring one element to like a higher uh, level of detail or quality in general, sometimes you'll, you'll have to uh, readjust everything else afterwards. <laughs> yeah, we, we sometimes re reworked all the stuff to match the quality basically of the newer ones. Uh, thankfully, it didn't happen too much because, you know, it. It's not like, okay, we need more high poly models now that we are two generations of consoles ahead of what we started with. But rather, you know, um, of course, Ola and Fabi got, got much better in the process of actually building these puppets. And um, so it's, it was mostly the first one or two experimental, more experimental things that ha would have been reworked. Uh, Cypher AB6 asks, is is this 3d printed or sculpted it's sculpted so this mm -hmm. is all like polymer clay uh which is basically like the stuff you you bake in your oven at home uh from, from like the craft store uh, and then it's painted with mm -hmm. um, acrylic paint at this little mm -hmm. might as well it's right here mm -hmm. uh, we have this little station set up um, with all kinds of all kinds of painting equipment um, that we use to sort of layer over these baked models. Um, and then these are all like actual textile clothes. Um, some stop motion animation people work in the same fashion. Because again, uh, the clothes like 
pick up the movement of the, the puppets and we were able to, again, recreate this in uh, the 3D scan. Love, wow. love the little clothes. This is so amazing. My favorite, uh, my favorite part. Yeah. Lurking Ninja <laughs> asks, do you still have every single piece or do you reuse parts? Based on the conversation with the cash register. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sadly, we don't reuse anything. <laughs> so nothing is reused. Oh, this. Well, we actually, in fact, we did modify one character. There is... Uh, the, the, the secretary brothers, it's uh, three brothers, but then there is the fourth brother who's like the odd one out <laughs> or so, uh, as they call it. And um, the, the other three look like triplets, basically, uh, or are triplets. The fourth one has a mustache and a beard and is tattooed. So we modified the same character because it was important for us to have him look like very, very similar to the other one, like, like a fake one of the other three you know so um yeah we did have uh, so this is deeply packaged sorry by the way if i sometimes uh seemingly or seem drunk by moving the camera because my my preview is like super leggy so i try to best to counter counter <laughs> no, it's, looking good. it's looking good it looks great for us okay great yeah uh yeah so this is one more uh, very steady hands of the in the very end when like all the actual like uh, main characters um were finished we had a couple more like um filler people essentially added that uh are so there's i think there's two more of these uh, and the idea was to have um these lighter textured models so we could um change the like color of the textures and just in some of the like more like when you have like a large audience scene or something right uh, just in general have some like npc ish uh killer, killer characters uh, so you make it white so that digitally you can then change it to any color right you could change the exactly. albedo yeah. yeah that's one okay that's great. switch out their heads in between them yeah, i think there's three more like random character heads um that i see just be swapped between uh, okay. Like some modular it's, it's like for, yeah some extras basically they, yeah. they don't have dialogue and yeah uh, <laughs> it's one of our favorites actually oh there we go <laughs> that bathrobe <laughs> Can, can we show this in the internet actually it, <laughs> like do we have an age cover rating him up, or... cover him up <laughs> no. No, that, that is a sculpted man <laughs> yeah, we, we Ale. Wanted, this was like a, like a game dev reference i guess just because so much like concept art uh, works like this where it's just like they're they're like the most sculpted possible mm -hmm. Just shredded, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like impossibly shredded, and we just wanted like one of those characters around. Although we did, uh, yeah, he's, he's modestly covered up. For, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there is the mustache too. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> A lot of times they're like disassembled, like this, just, uh, for scanning purposes. Yeah, the technical, like dressing the puppets and prepare them to be in people. Mm -hmm. uh, you would have to like cut them up into pieces or something. Um, yeah. yeah, we should probably get into the... Yeah, so maybe we can look at the little yeah. props. Um, yeah, but the first thing before we remove this person's... Uh, I'm doing, doing a very dramatic shot of Ole looking at the huge wall of boxes <laughs> <laughs> what have i done <laughs> yeah You, you might have the mic covered, uh, Anna. 
Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, w- I was just explaining. Well, it depends actually. All of that. Uh, you know, if you, if you want to do like 4D video or so, you would have a rig with multiple cameras. But you know, a lot of photogrammetry happens like that, where you know, photogrammetry is basically a technique where you make dozens or hundreds of photos of any object. And okay, we have a little little fishy thing here on here <laughs> right now. By the way. Oh, it nice. Maybe it's too bright. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> and, so cute. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so you basically take h- hundreds of photos of an object, and then there you have a software that, okay, we have here. By the way, this is of the t- TV series, the pilot that I talked uh, about before that our uh, oh, Google great. friend of, uh, of ours is working on. So he scanned uh, this little spaceship thing before. Nice. Um, so this software, in this case, it's capturing reality, basically um, takes all those photos and then compares like common points between them to build, to, to reconstruct a 3D model out of it. Oh, yeah. And you see the real model in beside of that. Yeah. Oh, there we um, go. So it basically sticks all those photos together and... Uh, you know, creates this like super um, high resolution, like a, a 10 mi- million pig, uh, polygons model out of that. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously these are not game ready models, but from that process on, we we then need to clean them up and, you know, make game ready model of, of, of them. By the way, on a side note, uh, to, to like funny trivia things, this is like the very first turntable Oh yeah, and because we did, we we have like mostly small objects, we usually use the turntable to to scan them. So the camera is static in our case, and um, we put the objects on a turntable, turn it a little bit, do a photo, turn it a little bit, do a photo, and usually do this uh-huh. from like three different angles. So we cover like the upper parts and the lower parts again, and. Um, yeah, fun fact, this turntable was the very first one we had, which was lying around in the kitchen of some one of ours. Okay. And um, we wanted to switch it with two technically better turntables over time, but we never kind of felt the connection to them as we did to this one. So this is still <laughs> the one we started using 10 years, 10 years ago almost. That's amazing. Um, it also, it's a very technical process. As you can see, we are lighting, you know, the, the objects from the front because right. what we actually want is to have as little lighting information as possible on on the objects when we scan them because we want to do the dynamic lighting inside of Unity. Yeah. And uh, another fun fact: this is actually not the same photogrammetry setup, Ola, because this is the second camera. Um, we it's actually a mirror, mirrorless camera in this case. The first camera we had was a Ken SLR camera, and we broke the mirror of it by taking photos. In fact, we took over a million photos um, up oh to my. this point. Oh my gosh! So the it was basically stress testing the camera, and yeah, we <laughs> decided that it would probably be more reasonable to go with a mirrorless one, where the mirror couldn't break by taking photos. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Out of curiosity, what so- software was that that you just showed us uh, once uh, that's, you... Uh, capturing Reality. Capturing Reality. Or actually, Capturing Reality is the company. The software is called Reality Capture. <laughs> I get these mixed ups <laughs> often. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So back to the boxes. Yes. Hidden voodoo doll boxes. Is there, is it because, has the Onat doll now officially become a voodoo doll as a result of its creation? <laughs> oh, oh God, don't, don't bring them. Uh, don't give them any ideas. Don't, don't, yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm really scared. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is reminding me so much. Is it Stanley Kubrick who, who also, there was like a doc, mini documentary on like the fact that he just has like a million boxes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> really? Like, yeah. Which one shall we choose? Okay, what's in here? Yeah, I was just hoping to get to um, this lamp, for example, that we used to display the uh, mm, yeah. lighting on earlier. 
Oh, that's great. Yeah, so this was the lamp we were looking at in the main market area, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. Uh, By the way, that was a... a okay, I, I have to find it like this. This was a trend at that time between Ole and Fabi that they put like little heads on pretty much everything they built. <laughs> that's why the why the by the lamp has a little head i don't know what where where, where, where did the inspiration for that come Ola? i'm sure we saw it <laughs> a lot of the game is based on like the stuff in our neighborhood including uh, like one thing uh, like people from cologne will recognize is the bar sign yeah the little drinking guy that's where the texture um is it's like there's something similar to that like a neon uh ad billboard situation basically for mm -hmm. a cologne based beer but those are those are just the secret <laughs> little bit Easter, relevant real world for easter eggs for the moment is uh again if you can pick up on this uh, oh yeah yeah Sorry. um yeah as for like normal bap scanning basically like this looks really weird in the real world like i don't know if, yeah let me see if i can get it to focus um like the surface so of the lamp. This looks like a pretty like bumpy, lumpy ball uh, in the real world, and it's just got like plain uh, opaque white painted onto it. But again, we're able to like use the scan texture of this um, to affect the actual lighting uh, right. of this lamp in the game. Yeah, uh, which makes for part of that that realism uh, effect. Yeah, that turns into the glass, right? Once, once you bring exactly, it and that's yeah. that's also nice that you know you, uh, the HD render pipeline has these nice, like translucent materials, which mm. works really well with you know these uh, handcrafted textures. I would say because you know in that case we we are um, or or surface because we are basically capturing the surface and throwing away the color, which is white in this case, but making it transparent, but. And um, through the surface structure, we have this nice, like, uh, both the reflections on the outside and also the translucency from the inside. Okay, this is one of those, like, more crowded boxes. Yeah, but there's so many goodies. Oh, yeah. This is like a mini game that, that might appear in the game. Yeah. Oh, okay. So for the, for the mini games, we often build, uh, this is much bigger in scale than, you know, uh, all the other stuff. So um, it's actually uh, funny. We, we were uh, thinking a bit about like those, uh, I don't know, SpongeBob or Ren Stimpy cartoons where sometimes you have these zoomed in sequences, which are like far more detailed. Yeah. And uh, our like sometimes we have computer panels or so or, you know, some plugs like this or plug sockets like this, but, which are, um, you know, in the in the game world are only like 20 centimeters or so. But then you zoom in because you interact with them and they are like suddenly super detailed. Oh, okay, so it's great to see that in real life they're actually quite big. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think chat would like to know if there's a box somewhere which only contains other boxes. <gasps> yeah. there, there is. There is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they want. They want we a box. To, we need to see that box. <laughs> Do you know where it is? Oh, it's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course, it's so high up. <laughs> <laughs> there we go oh so nice good question good question chat <laughs> very good question <laughs> there we go <laughs> <laughs> you can't make this up <laughs> you cannot yeah, yeah, make this so up this so was nice. not staged <laughs> got all the boxes. that's incredible yeah that, that's the beauty of, of being live you know and that <laughs> we didn't plan anything like that and <laughs> it's actually nice that 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 shows because we you know we, we moved into this office spaces like half a year ago and it was also the point where we thought okay we have to sort all that stuff once again otherwise it would have been impossible to find these things like so fast yeah it shows that that Ola and uh, Daniel did a so great, well great job of like sorting, organizing all yeah, that again this is like so fake and down the line basically for such a long time, we were like working out of like bedrooms and just had had so many like messy, messy scenarios of just mm -hmm. being surrounded by like piles of this stuff. And now it, it makes it look very uh, orderly and, mm -hmm. and organized. Yeah, it started like, out like very long. small. You know, we, we actually started in the kitchen of one of us and then moved to uh, basically, you know, where I studied game design, we got got this room we could use for a year as like a 
you know, supporting us. And then we moved into our first office like four years ago or so. Mm -hmm. So just abstract paintings. For the <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> oh, like a little art bag. <laughs> yeah. we, should, we also have to put up a little mini art gallery because there is a lot of like yeah. miniature art in the game besides of you know the objects themselves we have quite a lot of paintings which are in fact like real acrylic or oil pen paintings right um, oh my gosh that'll be so meta you'll have your game release <laughs> which is an exhibition and then within it will be a mini museum of your game within that is a mini museum of the actual paintings in the game oh my, <laughs> oh my. <laughs> One more intricate thing otherwise this could probably you know naturally go on forever yes <laughs> we could go through this but it's a good thing to uh... <laughs> Kind of guitar. There we go. Yeah. Oh wow! That oh must have been hard. Little instruments. Oh it's my! It's so detailed. <laughs> Even the little fret, like yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really nice. <laughs> yeah, as Ola said, we could go go on with this like for hours. You can imagine. By the way, we have around like. If we count all those little boxes, which obviously are much easier to build uh, than, um, you know, the boxes in the boxes, I mean, much easier to build than, for example, a, gu a guitar. We, I think, have around like 800 to 1,000 individual objects in the oh game. My God. So, yeah. Yeah. These numbers, 1,000 objects, 1 million photographs. Yeah, we did this <laughs> like, just... nice trivia uh, collection at one point, and we um, realized we had used about 200 kilograms of clay just for the characters, and yeah. which is about like 45 of them or so. And then um, if you put like all the walls and floors of all the sets um, beside each other, it would amount to... Uh, space of like 200 square meters oh my God. um filled like with just with walls and floors <laughs> so yeah it's it, it's been a it's been a bit okay so if you do you want to show something specific no, maybe? Was, yeah I figured yeah <laughs> yeah cypher from chat says uh this team is really prepared for ransomware or a hack uh, even if they lose the digital copies, they still have the physical ones. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, then we can maybe show just a little the, the space where we actually do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, we just moved in here like half a year ago. So it's, it's nice to be able to show it this way because, you know, we used to have a little office space and a little workshop somewhere else. So we are a small team anyway and often this team would have would would be split up into two locations and uh it's, it was like off sourcing outsourcing <laughs> internally our stuff um and it's now super nice that we finally found a location where we could combine the office space and the um the uh yeah basically the workshop together um so <laughs> oh, there yeah. we go. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of, a lot of. Of course, it's not as interesting if people aren't working in here. It's, uh, it got late here already. But for example, this is the, you know, usually where Fabi, who have, who you have briefly seen before, um, who was sitting beside of us, is welding a lot of stuff. Yeah, here is like the, the welding yeah. things and so on, and, um. Yeah, maybe maybe you can do the, 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 the work. This is the physical metal. engine behind the game. Yeah, it is. <laughs> the metal workshop. Uh, the, again, the, a lot of the uh, floors, for example, are all like uh, metal that is uh, uh, welded and like uh, nailed into place, and we are like benefiting from putting rust on the walls and letting that like age with actual like water and chemicals. Oh wow. Um, there's a little like um fab lab. Yeah. It's a fab lab. 
which you know is actually not something that we extensively used for the or not not at all used for the game in fact but uh for probably future projects and so on yeah. with like 3d printing stuff and nice. whatever where things have evolved to basically exactly something like each time we basically used like a tinier version of this in the actual game and, uh, yeah there's like a modular station uh, or like corner in the room uh, previously and now we have a ceramic space <laughs> nice I find I find it mind blowing the amount of effort like put into this when you when you mention little things like taking the metal, putting it in water and chemicals to actually achieve real rust rather than just, you know, faking it or painting it on. You're actually going into all this effort to pull that off. It's uh well, yeah. it's quite the stunning. The thing is how like this all ties into like our uh like way of being as <laughs> like individual people, like all the people from the team uh essentially this workshop is like an accumulation of like everybody's like individual curiosity everybody likes to like toy with different materials and processes and the game is just like the like hub where all of that we're like able to bring the groups like uh yeah fascination for all these things to, uh, together and and now we were able to like um yeah have bring it into this physical space mm -hmm. as well <laughs> Yeah. all these crafts yeah. coming together towards one goal yeah i think yeah. like you're the ideal dream team i mean uh, we talk a lot about creating teams when you're an indie game developer who do you find where and it's just like it's like you said it's just a pure beautiful coincidence that all these great people came together to make like a great game but beyond that like you, i love that you said it was like the game is just a hub for all of this <laughs> yeah yeah true everyone to express themselves individually but also collectively yeah. Uh, everyone in chat is just, uh, you know, talking about, yeah, how unique they find your team and how, you know, oh, how, yeah, how much thank, of a dream team it is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sarfri <laughs> says, we, we don't get to see this kind of effort and idea when we play the game. So what goes on behind the scenes is really awesome. So we're really happy that at Unity, we can showcase that to you. That's Absolutely. all we do is showcase what happens behind the scenes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so heading back, heading back in. I I hope you guys enjoyed the studio tour. <laughs> was there anything in particular that you guys were going to show? I think that was it. Yeah. No, that was yeah. It. Pretty much covered it. Is there anything else you guys want to see? <laughs> I think you showed us quite a lot. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> We've really gotten to know you. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, I hope uh, chat you enjoyed everything. Thanks for um, you really went into great detail about how you created the tools and um, your reasons for using which version you did for the engine. I think uh, that's really nice to see. And thanks for using the latest version of the beta. It makes me really happy as well. <laughs> and, that for ch and chat for really getting excited about it as well. Um, makes me really happy that we're steering the ship in the right direction for all of you. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Ana Nola, for taking a huge portion of your evening to show us all this. We really appreciate it. Um, I think chat really showed a lot of love too. Um, yeah. We're really excited for the game. Um, so remember, wishlist the game. It's coming out uh, on console and PC. Um, we're throwing the link in chat. At least, uh, please wish list it because it helps the developers a lot. Um, mm. uh, and don't worry, the stream is available on demand after. We will be releasing it on YouTube afterwards so you can watch it. But uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for coming by, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And Thank thanks you. for the great questions. And um, yeah, I, we, we're, <laughs> the box and box thing was actually really great. <laughs> and yeah. Shout out to the to rest of moment. our team, by the way. Yes. Obviously, you know, it, it this all wouldn't be possible with all the nice people who have worked off with us the whole time. And shout out to Adam Michael, by the way. If I had to name one single a Unity tool, it would be Cinemachine. And it really changed the way we mm -hmm. worked in a game engine. So, um, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 100% shout out to him. I'm going to clip this little part and send it his way. Send it to Adam. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he, gets a, he gets major shout outs pretty often, actually, for some issue. It's one of those things that people really love. So, yeah, thank you so yeah. much for that. Thank you so much. Have a good one. And um, chat, uh, 
thanks join us tomorrow there's another stream we're going to be checking out pray for the gods another game that has a lot of work going into it in a completely different way than this oh, yeah. game so that's what's so unique about it so again we love indies week continues and we'll have another stream on thursday as well and we'll be checking out um my brain is blanking yeah. <laughs> sorry <laughs> uh, pray for the gods and then the next day we'll be, uh, we'll be looking at uh, Minute of Violence. Minute of Violence. Ooh, that's yes. a really great one. So if you're Adventure Time fans, definitely come check this out. Three such that three games that they took a lot of there's a lot of minutia that goes into making it look a very mm -hmm. specific way and very like interesting way that they approach it. I'm really excited to show it yeah, to you. Yeah, Minute of Violence also handcrafted in a different way. Uh, big beautiful 2D vistas. So come check that out. If you enjoyed yeah. the stream, I'm sure you're going to enjoy that one as well. Yeah. Thanks again yeah. to uh, Ola and Anat. Like, we'll see you, see you in the chat all soon. See you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.